Many are they that rise up against me. Many there be which say of my soul, There is no help for him in God. But thou, O Lord, art a shield for me, my glory and the lifter up of my head. I cried unto the Lord with my voice, and he heard me out of his holy hill. I laid me down and slept. I awaked, for the Lord sustained me. I will not be afraid of ten thousands of people that have set themselves against me round about. Arise, O Lord, save me, O my God, for thou hast smitten all mine enemies upon the cheekbone. Thou hast broken the teeth of the ungodly. Salvation belongeth unto the Lord. Thy blessing is upon thy people. God is good. And all the time. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, everyone. How was the lunch? Did you enjoy it? Good. Where did it come from? God. Yes, God, yes. Oh, yes, God. There are people around the world who do not see food like that. There are people, millions of people, who have no idea what three meals a day means. They just have no clue. And so when we sit and we eat the way we did today, we ought to pause to thank God and ask God, use me to ease someone else's suffering. Because very few people eat the way we eat. It's a blessing from God to have food. There are two ways to be hungry. You're hungry because I don't want to eat. Then there's hungry because I have nothing to eat. And I suspect for all of us, if we're hungry, we just don't want to eat or we're far from home. But there are so many who are hungry and they have no choice. And so thank God for food. When I turn on the, 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 the switch at my house, the light comes on, I thank God. You know, God has sent me all over the world. I've been places where that does not happen. There's no switch to turn on in the first place. You turn the tap in your house, the water comes. There are places where people walk miles to get water. When they get home, they boil it to drink it. I mean, I've been to those places. And so when the Bible says, in everything, give thanks, the longer you live, the more that verse makes sense to you. I've been to places where they say, call the police. What police? <laughs> they have no cars. <laughs> if you call them, they tell you, come get us. Here, no matter how we criticize the police, you call them, they come. Are you with me? Your cat gets stuck in the tree, you call the fire department, and they come and get it down. You tell that to some people in other parts of the world, it makes no sense to them. A fire department comes to rescue a cat? No sense. And so let's learn to thank God. Thank God. I've been to places driving through the bush. There are no signposts. You just have to know which bush to turn left at or right. Seriously. Here, I have a friend in Australia, and she said, she loves driving in the United States because you can go from Alaska to Florida just by following the signs. And so I'm simply trying to say to us, let's live with a spirit of thankfulness to God. Mm-hmm. All right. Um, I want to talk to you about something. If you've heard it before, you may just close your ears or go to sleep, but don't snore. It has to do with prophecy. Now, in the book, Great Controversy, well, let me pray first. Father in heaven, as I speak to those whom you love so much, grant me wisdom from above, I pray. Help me to try to glorify your name, not simply by what I say, but how I say it. Grant me your spirit. Grant me humility. Grant me the ideas and the words. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. And you remember to ask God, please put his words in my mouth. Think. And if you're not using these things, let me tell you why I always tell people, turn these things off. <laughs> I was in Boston. You may have heard this again if you listen to the sermons online. Preparing to speak. I was in my hotel room. The meeting was held in a conference room in the hotel. While I was reading the Bible, this one, well, the, on the phone, this phone, if you have a smartphone, little advertisements pop up at the bottom. Have you ever noticed that? And I'm reading the Bible. Here's a preacher reading the Bible. At the bottom of the phone comes this ad, How to Date Asian Women. 
All I had to do was take one of my 10 fingers and just touch it. And I would have had a Smithsonian gallery of Asian faces to choose from. It cannot happen with this. Am I talking to myself? It cannot happen with this. If the sermon gets boring, I can go to my pictures, my email, my Instagram, my Outstagram, my you name it. I can go to it. Are you following me? Not with this. All this has is the word of God. There are no temptations when you open this. There are all kinds of temptations. When, that's why I usually say, if possible, I was in Zambia. God bless Zambia. I love that country. And while I was there, the Catholic Church made a ruling that in services, Bibles must be used, not phones. I didn't become a Catholic, but I was very excited when I heard that. <laughs> Bibles must be used, not these, in church. So anyway, we thank God for technology. Are you with me? These things are very helpful. All right. Now, I, uh, I was giving you a quotation, the great controversy, page 409, Paragraph 1. What did I say? The scripture, which above all others, had been both the foundation and the central pillar of the Advent movement, was the declaration, unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. What the servant of the Lord is telling us, that verse is the foundation stone of our theology. Unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. Where's that verse found? This side. That side. Daniel 8.14. Daniel 8.14, yes. It is the foundation stone of our theology, or what we call present truth. Now, a lot of churches preach biblical truth. True. We have present truth. Example. Baptism by immersion is preached by a lot of Christian churches. It is biblical truth. It is not present truth. Are you following me? Present truth, okay, I see someone by your first expression telling me, explain that. Present truth refers to a teaching particularly targeting a certain time in history. Paul did not preach the three angels' messages. It wasn't the time. Are you with me? The three angels' messages constitute present truth. And Eloise said, these are the messages God used to separate us from the rest of the world. That's why when I talk to young people about mixed marriages, Eloise defines an unbeliever as someone who doesn't follow present truth. You could be a good Pentecostal, and God loves you, a good whatever, but... To the Adventist mind, you're an unbeliever if you do not follow present truth. Not you're a bad person, you're just an unbeliever. By the way, to a Mormon, an Adventist is an unbeliever. Are you following me? To a Catholic, a Presbyterian is an unbeliever. <laughs> to a Muslim, a Christian is an unbeliever. And so for Adventists, present truth is what distinguishes us from other churches, even though all Christian churches have the same text. Now, let's go to uh, Revelation 13. Revelation 13, let's read from verse 1. And I have no title for this. It's just an informal chat between you and me. Under the direction of God. Revelation 13, let's read from verse 1. Do you have that? If you have my version, you may read with me. And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns. And upon his horns, ten crowns. And upon his head, what? The name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet was the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. And I saw one of his heads as it had been wounded to death. And his deadly wound was healed, finished the verse. And all the world, come on, wondered after the beast now. We are a people of prophecy. When you read, the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard. Where does your mind go? Daniel 7. 
where Daniel saw four animals coming out of the water. He had a dream. That leopard represented um, Greece. His mouth as the mouth of a bear, and his, as a lion, his feet as the feet of a bear. The same animals pop up in Daniel 7. And they represent uh, Medo-Persia, the bear. The leopard, of course, is uh, Greece. And this beast itself is the nondescript beast which no one had ever seen. Seven head, ten horn, teeth of iron. Now, that's prophecy. We know they represent literal nations. This beast that John saw in Revelation 13 has qualities of all the beasts of Daniel 7. Are you following me? This is prophecy. But we're discussing nations. Now, let's go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Let's read from verse 1. Maybe the only way I'd get you to read is ask some individuals to read. Who has my version? Okay, read for me, Sister Angelique, from verse 1 of 2 Thessalonians 2. Now we beseech you. Now we beseech you, brothers, mm -hmm. by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, mm -hmm. and by our gathering together, and to him, mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Be troubled. Neither by spirit mm -hmm. nor by word. Mm -hmm. Nor by the letter from us. As from an apostle. Pause right there. Let nothing shake you. Let nothing shake you. Neither by spirit, nor by word, nor as letter as from us. As that the day of what? Christ is at hand. You know, Paul is saying, don't let anyone deceive you that Christ is about to come. That's in Paul's day. He was not about to come. Now, Paul goes on. Next verse. Let... Stop. The devil has four well-known names in the Bible. Give me the four names. Serpent. serpent dragon. dragon. All right, let's get two from this side. You know, we had serpent, dragon, devil, and Satan. Go to Revelation 12, 9. Don't lose 2 Thessalonians, but you have 10 fingers. Put one in 2 Thessalonians. Let's go to Revelation 12, 9. Revelation 12, 9. Let's read from 7 so we get some connection. The sun doesn't set until 8.30. We have time. Who has to rush off to work? All right. Okay. <laughs> Revelation 12, read from verse 7. Are you there? And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels, and prevailed not. Neither was the place found anymore in heaven. Now read verse 9 for me. And the great dragon was cast out. That old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. So we have that dragon. We have serpent. We have now the four names each has a meaning. Dragon means what? Destroyer. Destroyer. Satan. No. No. All right. Let's go to Zechariah chapter 3. Zechariah chapter 3. Don't forget to keep hold on 2 Thessalonians 2. Do you have Zechariah 3? Find Malachi, work your way back two more books, you'll come to Zechariah. Or one book, I should say. All right, read with me, verse 1. And he showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord and Satan standing at his right hand to resist him or to oppose him. Are you with me? Now, so Satan is a what? An opposer. Yeah, a resistor, yes. Now, he's, devil means accuser. And serpent means now, come on, think of the serpent in the garden. What did he do? The serpent beguiled me or deceived me. Now, he deceives, he accuses, he opposes, he destroys. Which one is most effective? Deception. 
He tried destruction in the centuries after Christ, and the more he killed, the more the church grew. So he set that aside, part mostly, and he used deception. He brought in paganism into the church, baptized paganism, make it look like Christianity, and he succeeded. I mean, remarkably, he used deception. Now, let's finally go back to 2 Thessalonians. Sister Angelique, read for us verse 3. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3. Okay, pause. Let no man deceive you by any means. <laughs> now, what does no man mean? Not the politician, not your spouse, not your children, not a church pastor, not the police. Are you with me? Not the mayor. Let no one deceive you by any means. And the only way to protect yourself from deception is to study this and obey. Amen. Listen to me carefully. A PhD, God bless all PhDs, do not provide protection against deception. A lot of the damage done to the Bible was done by PhDs in theology. That's not a strike against PhDs. I'm simply saying only a knowledge of God's word is protection against deception. Let no man deceive you by any means. Someone pick up verse 4. Uh, finish verse 3. I'll finish verse 3, Sister Angelique. Mm -hmm. Uh-huh. And that man of sin be revealed. Now, who's the son of perdition or who's the man of sin? The same person we read about in Revelation 13. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, his feet were the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. That beast that is part of all the four beasts of Daniel 7, this is the man of sin, which we call the Antichrist which we call the little horn, which we call the beast. Now, when you think of the little horn, what comes to mind? Do you think internally or externally? Externally. Follow me closely. When you think of the little horn, you think externally. There's a power somewhere that's a little horn. When you think of the leopard of Daniel 7, you think externally. When you think of the close of probation, you may think of a date. Now, we have no date for that. When you think of the sanctuary service, which is also part of the foundation of our theology, because Daniel 8, 14 has to do with the sanctuary, the cleansing of the sanctuary, we think externally. When we think of the signs of the last days, wars, rumors of wars, we think externally. Wars, Afghanistan, maybe Ukraine now, somewhere else, and there are wars going on. We no longer hear about They've been raging for so long. We think earthquakes in diverse places. We think of the, the, the rim of fire, the earthquake rim somewhere in Southeast Asia or the western part of the United States and South America. That's how we think. All of that is prophecy. And all of that is proper. When we think of the seven last plagues, what do we think of? Things that will happen, the sun will get hot, there will be hail, stone, or whatever else. We think externally. <laughs> mm, that's prophecy. But that's not all the prophecy there is. Let's go to 2 Timothy now. Chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3. In what history of the world are we living now? Come on, you're taking too long. In the last days. We're living in the last days. Let me ask you this. Are there any other time prophecies that have to be fulfilled? No. What was the last one? October 22, 1844. There are no more time prophecies to be fulfilled understand me clearly. Not in the Bible, not in the spirit of prophecy. Actually, she tells us there's no other time prophecy. We should not be setting dates. We are in the last days. 
Now there's the time of the end and there's the end of time. Let me pause. When did the time of the end begin? Take your time. 70 to 98, the time of the end, the time for end time events to occur. When did the end of time begin? October 22, 1844, the end of prophetic time. Are you with me? No, you're not. Let's say that again. <laughs> Some of you look delightfully confused. Listen carefully, we're Adventists. There's something called the end of time. There's something called the time of the end. The time of the end refers to the time when certain things began to be fulfilled, suggesting we're coming into the last days. That began 1798 with the fall of the papacy. The end of time, 1844, uh, October 22, the end of prophetic time, there are no more events dated that will occur after 1844. So that's what the two things mean. All right. When we think of the seven last plagues, I said, we think externally. Now let's read 2 Timothy chapter 3, beginning at verse 1. But let me pray again. Father, as we enter into 2 Timothy, grant us clear understanding, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Someone on this right side, read for me if you have my version. Thank you, Sister Angelique, for reading. Uh huh. Okay, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. What are the last days? Give me another expression for the last days. Time of the end. Mm. End of time, time of the end. The last days. That's what we're living in. Paul did not live in the last days. Notice the wording, this know also that in the last days, perilous times shall come. What does that suggest? Future. Let me repeat, Paul did not live in the last days. Not in Matthew or Silas or Timothy or any of these powerful preachers or Peter. They did not live in the last days. Paul spoke of judgment to come. So he writes to Timothy, this know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. Now, give me, tell me what the word perilous means. Dangerous. Dangerous. Give me another word. Risky. <laughs> yeah. Hazardous. Life-threatening. Will there be persecution, yes or no? Yes, of God's people. Will there be a Sunday law? Yes. Will there be a death penalty? Yes. Perilous times. But when you think of the Sunday law, you're not the one passing it. You think externally. Someone else will pass it. Are you following me? And I keep stressing externally. Someone else will pass the Sunday law. Perilous times shall come. Now, listen to why the times, the last days, will be perilous. Keep reading, my dear brother. Brother Barr, I think, is reading. Pause. <laughs> well, no, pause, 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 pause. <laughs> it's okay, it's okay, it's my fault. Now, what time, what are we discussing? Perilous. perilous time. Give me another word for perilous. Dangerous times. And what's the first thing Paul says? Men shall be lovers. Come on. Let me ask you this. Does the beast have anything to do with that? No. No. The beast can't make you love yourself. That's a choice. So we now have to think how? Internally. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Is this prophecy? Yes. Why are we always begging for money in the church? <laughs> Come on, read the words. <laughs> yes. People love themselves more than they love the work. Is this prophecy? Is this preached about? No. Men shall be lovers of their own selves. Come on, what's the next one? Covetous, stop. Is that the 10th commandment? Yes. Do you know someone who's covetous is an idolater? Let the Bible tell you. Go to Ephesians 5 quickly. We're looking at internally now, not externally. 
Let's give the beast a vacation. Someone criticized me for saying that, but I hope you understand what I mean. Let's give the beast a break for a few minutes, just a few minutes. Let's look at us. Where did I send you? All right, let's read verse 5. Now, Paul, let's read from verse 3. Paul is telling the Ephesians things that should not occur among the brethren. Are you with me? Read from verse 3, someone for me. But, Ephesians 5 from verse 3. I'm going to read this, Angeli. Fornication and all. Uh-huh. Let it not be once named among you. Mm -hmm. Paul says, don't even do it once. <laughs> because if you do it once, what happens? You may do it again. Listen to me. Don't do it once. Verse 4. Filthiness, talking, which are not, but rather, now listen to verse 5 carefully. For this you know, come on. Uh-huh. 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 Uh -huh. Stop. <laughs> A covetous person, come on, is an idolater. Why? Because the thing he or she covets is an idol. <laughs> the thing the person covets, you see, an idol doesn't have to be wood and stone. Ellen White writes, it is just as easy to make an idol of false doctrines or theories as to fashion an idol of wood or stone. When you know the seven days of Sabbath and you persist in keeping Sunday, that's an idol. Because you've placed it ahead of God. Mm -hmm. so you have a lot of idol worshiping going on on Sundays. On Sabbath too. I've run into some women for whom the desire to get married is an idol. That's all they think about, dream about, eat, sleep. I want to get married. It becomes an idol. Every covetous person is an idolater. Let's look at idolatry again. <laughs> then we'll get back to Second uh, um, Thessalonians. Go to Philippians chapter 3. No, I mean we'll get back to 2 Timothy, chapter 3. Philippians 3. Let's read from verse 17. Now Paul is appealing to the members to follow him and his fellow preachers as examples. Of course, only as they follow Christ. Do you have verse 17 of Philippians 3? Someone else read for us if you have my version. Brethren, follow us together. Uh-huh. 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 For an example, in other words, keep your eye on other people who are not reliable examples. But we are your examples. Keep reading. For many walk. For many walk. Mm-hmm. Often, mm-hmm. Even weeping, mm-hmm. That they are enemies of the cross of Christ. Pause right there. Pause right there. I have a lot of young people come to me. They said, Elder Skeet, should I listen to Marilyn Hickey? Should I, uh, can I go to these Sunday churches because they have the spirit, but we have the word? <laughs> That's what they tell me. We have the word, but they have the spirit. The Bible says the spirit is the spirit of truth. So we have these other people who walk, and we have to be careful. Can I go listen to Joel Osteen? And my question is, can you defend the truth? If you can't, stay where you are. Because the carnal mind is primed to accept error. Are you listening to me? The carnal mind accepts error the way a sponge accepts water. Many walk, of whom I've told you often, and now tell you even weeping, they are the enemies of the cross of Christ, and they occupy pulpits. Keep reading, my dear sister. Whose end is... Now listen carefully. Stop. <laughs> Whose God is their belly. What does that mean, without embarrassing me or you? What does that mean? Appetite, Appetite is the God. Mm -hmm. And so thou shalt have not the gods before me is much more than an idol made of stone. That's why God's law is so vast. So high, so deep, so broad, so dense. Okay, let's go back to 2 Timothy chapter 3. 
Let's read again from verse 1. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. Brother Bauer, you were reading. For men... Mm, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Proud. Mm -hmm. Pause. <laughs> Pause. Where are the children? <laughs> okay. <laughs> One of the signs of the end is disobedience to parents. Now, children have always been, but particularly in these last days, disobedient parents. And Paul calls that perilous times. He does not mention the papacy. He doesn't mention the seven last plagues. <laughs> he did, now, he's not saying they, don't, they won't happen. They'll happen, but he is focusing on that which has to do with injury. Mm -hmm. Because that is part of prophecy. Now, when you see that now, you, you say, wait a minute now, let me leave the beast alone for a minute <laughs> and fix myself. Are you following me? <laughs> because I'm doing more to contribute to perilous days than the beast. Let me, am I covetous? But we don't like confrontation with self because that's a horror movie. Are you following me? And so we, we look at the beast. We look at, you know, we look at him. You look at me. Look, this is all external. But Paul's statement goes right in your face. Disobedient to parents, unthankful and unholy. Next verse. Stop. Just can't love people. Can't love people. Without natural affection. Go on. Pause. You make a commitment to support the church building and you don't keep it. Go on. Accusers, mm hmm. Incontinent, no control. No control. Fierce. Listen to me. There, there are members in churches who will fight you physically and not think twice. Mm hmm. There are pastors who've been attacked by members. Literally. Fierce. Sabbath keeping violent people. Paul says that's part of perilous times. That's part of the prophetic picture of the last days. Members who will get up in your face and let you know you can't tell me anything. I'll fight you to pass. I don't care. Mm -hmm. Keep reading, Brother Bauer. You yeah, pause. Here's someone in the church. I was in a certain country. One of the saddest stories I've ever heard. This young lady came to me. She was very depressed. She had been raped by an elder. Because the elder said, you're too high and mighty trying to look all holy. How could I bring you down? And raped the girl. He was bothered by the way she tried to live her life. Now, if you remember your life in high school, when you tried to do what's right, didn't your friends pick on you? Yes. Simply because you were doing what's right. It goes all the way back to Cain and Abel. Why did Cain kill Abel? Because Abel was simply, and the Bible tells us that, 1 John 3, 12, he killed him because he was right, and, Abel was, and Cain was wrong. Despises of those that are good. Instead of supporting those, encouraging, we despise those who live by Ellen White's counsel. We despise those who consider in country living. We call them extremists. So there are signs in the church that the papacy has nothing to do with. Now, I'm not getting the papacy off the hook. Don't misunderstand me. I hope you see the point I'm making. Me! Now, Ella White tells us in Mind, Character and Personality, Volume 2, page 423, paragraph 2, the gospel deals with individuals. Every human being has a soul to save or to lose. Each has an individuality separate and distinct from all others. He must, re, he must be convicted for himself, converted for himself. He must receive the truth, repent, believe, obey for himself. He must exercise his will for himself. Because God saves individuals. He saves individuals. When God came to the garden, he didn't make one coat of skin and put Adam and Eve in it. He made two. When they sinned, they made two aprons. Sin is individual, salvation is individual. Understand me clearly. Keep reading, my dear brother. Verse 4. Yes. Yes. 
Mm -hmm. Oh, mm, pause, 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 pause. Lovers of, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. Hey, that really applies to us. We can't wait for the sun to set so we can watch the playoffs. Are you with me, brothers? <laughs> Just can't wait for whatever, for the fashion show to come on. We are lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. The sermon goes over by five minutes. We get upset, but we sit through overtime for the football game. And no problem at all. Secular things have a greater control of our lives than the spiritual lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. Keep reading. Uh-huh. Oh, yes. From such. Wait a minute now. This is frightening. From such. Turn away. Let me choose my words very carefully. You cannot be close to everyone in the church just because they're physically in the church. You've got to choose people carefully. Now, we must love everyone, but you don't have to be close to everyone. Having a form of godliness, but denying because as you and that person interact, one will affect the other. And so you've got to be careful. Now, I have no children, but if I had children, my children would not interact with a lot of children I see in church. And I've seen them all over the world. Mm -hmm. I'd be very careful to whom I expose my children. The people who said crucify him were people who went to church. The people who were always trying to kill Christ were not the Romans. They were church members. Okay. Lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof from such turn away. Be careful with whom you associate, even in the church. But don't place yourself above anyone else. But you must be careful. Because they summon the church with attitudes that will have a negative effect on your spiritual growth. Now, all what we just read is prophecy. But it's prophecy that causes us to look how? Internally. So you look at it again, men shall be lovers of their own selves, you ask, is he talking to me? Covetous, is he talking to me? Proud, blasphemous, disob is he talking to me? What contribution am I making to perilous times? By the way, I live my life. Go to 1 Timothy chapter 4. We're looking at the last days again. Someone read from verse 1. Uh huh. Yes. Wait a minute. This is the same Paul writing. He says the Spirit speaks how? What does that mean? Clearly. Clearly. Give me another word. To the point. To the point. Mm -hmm. Directly. Can't miss it. In the latter times, what's that? Come on, come on. What's the latter times? In the last days. Remember he said the last days in chapter 3 of the second book, verse 1. Now he says the latter times, same thing. Some shall depart from the faith. Is that a prophetic statement? Yes. Now, you have to look at yourself. Am I departing from the faith? Adventists leave the church every day, every week, every year. We make a lot of fuss about the numbers baptized. We say nothing about those who go through the back door. Never come back. The Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times, some shall depart from the... Now, you have to decide, that's not me. That's not me. I recommit my life to be faithful to God, to live by thus saith the Lord. So I do not join the crowd that's departing from the church. When Christ comes by his grace, 
he'll find me faithful, ready to meet him. We're talking about the last days, these days. There'll be an exodus from the church. But Ellen White says, many will come in. Keep reading. Some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines. Ah, pause. What is a seducing spirit? When you seduce someone, you're getting the person to behave how? A certain way. That a person should not behave. Now, what's a seducing spirit? Where did we meet the first seducing spirit on earth? In the Garden of Eden. What did God say? In the day thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. What did the spirit say? You shall not surely die. What did Eve say? The serpent beguiled me. She was seduced by a seducing spirit. How was the spirit successful? She let go of, thus saith the Lord. Are you with me? It's a very simple formula. You hold on to this, you cannot be seduced into error. You can make mistakes in your life. You cannot be seduced into error. You cannot be seduced into disrespecting God by turning your back on Him and becoming an agent of devil wearing the uniform of heaven. Giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils now. What is the doctrine of devils? We're still discussing prophecy and what will happen in the last days. But this now is from an internal point of view. Let's live aside the seven last plagues for a minute and the Sunday law. My spiritual condition. What is the doctrine of devils? It's simple. Let's go back to Eden. What did God say? Thou shalt surely die. What did the devil say? He shall not. What's the doctrine of devil? Well, give me a. Huh? Anything. Yes, anything that contradicts, thus saith the Lord, is a doctrine of devils. Did Jesus come to die for us? Go to Matthew uh, 16. Matthew 16, let's read from verse 21. You have Matthew 16. What did I tell you about Matthew this morning? He wrote mainly for a Jewish audience. And what clue do we have in the book that tells us that? Uh, yes, he keeps saying that it might be fulfilled, which was written, and he keeps saying that all over. He keeps quoting the Old Testament to convince the Jews Jesus Christ was the one spoken of in the Old Testament. Matthew 16, someone read from verse 21. Mm hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Now, not mu he must go into Jerusalem, come on, and suffer many things of the elders, chief priests, scribes, mm -hmm. be killed. Now, why did he say he has to go through that? It had been prophesied. He will suffer. He has to. He cannot go against the word. Now, verse 22. <laughs> Listen carefully to a nice man. Now, who's Peter? One of the close. You see, frequently, Christ only took Peter, James, and John with him. When he went to the Mount of Transfiguration, Matthew 17, he only took Peter, James, and John. When he healed the daughter of Jairus, Mark 5, 37, he only took Peter, James, and John into that room. When he went into the Garden of Gethsemane to suffer, he left eight at the gate, took Peter, James, and John. He was closer to them. One of these close men now is talking to Jesus. Are you with me? Read now, verse 22. Then Peter. Mm -hmm. He's rebuking God. <laughs> Peter is rebuking God. Are you with me? Christ was both. Keep reading. Mm -hmm. Stop. Did Peter love Jesus, yes or no? Yes. Did he mean any harm? No. But where was his mind? Christ will tell us in a minute. Read verse 23. So he and said to mm -hmm. Stop. Stop. Listen to me carefully. This is very, very serious. 
How long did it take Peter to say, be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee? How long does it take to say that? Five, six seconds. What I'm trying to tell you is this. You can be an agent of Satan in a very brief span of time and do tremendous damage. You didn't get what I said. Let me try it again. You, you see, Ellen White frequently talks about moment by moment. Moment by moment surrender, moment by moment connection, because Satan may only need five seconds. Mm -hmm. Now, if Jesus didn't know what he was about, if he had not been familiar with his father's word, he might have said to Peter, you know, that's a good idea. And then there would have been no gospel. Even though Peter had good intentions. He did not want his Lord to suffer. My listening friends, that was a doctrine of the devil spoken by the devil through Peter. Because Jesus knew his father's word, he recognized it, and in mercy, he rebuked the devil. Not so much Peter, because Peter had no clue he was being used by the devil. When Eve went to Adam, she was speaking for the devil. All right. You don't like what I just said? Didn't she encourage her husband to eat the fruit? Who told her to eat the fruit? So who is she representing? Satan. In that time. Praise God, she repented. She took the coats of skin in verse 21 of chapter 3 of Genesis. But in that time, she was the devil's agent. In that time, Peter was the devil's agent. Were you the devil's agent this week to anybody? Don't answer. You didn't need our or I. We don't need hours. Seconds. And cause someone depression. Seconds. Doctrines of devils. In the church. In the church. I told you this morning there are people in the church who say Christ had a beginning which makes him a created being. And no created being can be God. Doctrine of devils. There are people in the Adventist church who say there's no Holy Spirit. The Bible says, if you don't have the Spirit of God, you do not belong to God. Doctrine of devils. There are some who say there's no sanctuary service. Doctrine of devils. There are some who say when Christ died on the cross, the atonement was done. Doctrine of devils, because what are they saying is there's no need for intercession in heaven right now. Doctrine of devils. But nicely worded. You go, you drive, you, some of you fly on planes, I'm sure. Particularly on long flights international, they sell things on the plane you can buy. Alcohol is one. And there's a magazine that you can check which one you want to buy. You order it, and the flight attendant brings it. The bottles are beautiful. Cigarette boxes are beautifully designed. Doctrines of devils. In that beautifully designed box is cancer of the lung. In that beautifully designed bottle of whatever vodka from Russia is cirrhosis of the liver. That's where the devil functions. When he told Eve, he said, look, God in the snow, in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. He presented sin beautifully packaged, and she went for it. Doctrines of devils are very often beautifully presented. Universalism. A doctrine which says, God is so loving, he will deceive everyone, including the devil. Yet Jesus prayed and said to his father, none of them is lost but the son of perdition. You've got to be careful you're not living your life by a doctrine of devils because you don't study the word of God and you have little time for the enlightenment found in the counsel of Ellen White. The Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies in hypocrisy, having a conscience seared with a hot iron. Nothing the church says can reach them. 
We're discussing prophecy. But prophecy that has to do with you and me on an individual basis. And so I go back to 2 Timothy chapter 3. We have to go through that list. But then I'm going to ask you a question as we go through the list. 2 Timothy 3, reading from verse 1, let me pray, Father, as I continue to speak, remind me I am also part of what I'm talking about. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves. Pause. And don't answer me. I'll ask a question. Do not answer me. Does that apply to you? Do not answer me. Men shall, women shall be lovers of their own selves. Me ahead of God's work. Covetous. Everything I see, I want. One of the reasons for debt is a violation of commandment 10. Thou shalt not covet. Everything I see, I want. Is that applicable to me? Boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to... You can read the whole thing quietly and you decide which of these applies to me. And if it applies to me, I am contributing to perilous times. It's dangerous to live in a world where people are self-centered. Because they'll kill you. Are you listening to me? They'll kill you to protect theirs. Christ is, kill me to save you. A self-centered person, I'll kill you to save me. This is no joke. <laughs> Listen to me. When the Spirit of God does not control a person, there is no depth to which that person will not sink. Look at that list, 2 Timothy 3, 1 to 5. You decide quietly if anyone applies to you. Read it quietly. And if you need to make a change in your life, or I, this is prophecy. But we're not discussing the beast, or the Sunday law, or the seven last plagues or earthquakes in diverse places. We're looking at ourselves as individuals. Now let me ask you this. If any one of these things apply to any of us, can I see your hand? If any one of them apply to you, let me see your hand. All right, question for you. What will you do? Praise good, but that's not all. Repent. Repent. But repentance only has value if, it is if it's accompanied by... Yes, that's a good word. It starts with an R, then an E, then an F, then an O. Reformation. What does repentance mean? Turn away. Reformation means behave differently. So revival and reformation, revival means, oh, my eyes have been opened by truth. I come alive. Reformation means now I live differently. If you identified something in that passage that applies to you, your decision is I must repent and reform. So if covetous applies to you, God help me because nothing can be more deeply rooted in us than covetousness. Father, please, I need victory. Because I do not want to contribute to perilous times. And so we raise our hands. We ask God, please God, I want victory over this area. I now realize that the way I am contributes to negative prophecy. There's positive prophecy. Christ is coming. Can you say amen? Mm -hmm. He's coming to save the, the redeemed. He has positive prophecy. Negative prophecy is some people will be proud and self-centered and boasters and blasphemers, lovers of their own self. They'll hate those who are doing good. That's negative prophecy. Both must be fulfilled, but take your stand on the positive side. Can you say amen? Mm -hmm. Because in the last days, many shall have their eyes open to the truth and they'll come. Let's contribute to that. Should we pray?
Should we pray? Yes. yes. Yeah. I mean now. Yes. Mm-hmm. Is there something called a beast in prophecy? Yes. But that's not our concern now. That's all I'm saying. Will there be a seven last plague? Yes. That's not our concern now. We have our own plagues to deal with. <laughs> Are you following me? And they're all in 2 Timothy chapter 3, 1 to 5. Those are our personal plagues that have been falling in our lives. That has to stop. For you and for me. So we'll pray for a few minutes. Then we'll have some questions and answers. Is that okay? All right. Before we pray, quietly, because I'll end with a personal prayer, a private prayer, a public prayer, sorry. What prayer request do you have? Just raise your hand and tell us. Anyone? Not necessarily connected to 2 Timothy. I mean, prayer requests you had before we had this study. Yes, brother my Tyler. Son your son and your daughter. They've left the church. Someone go to Isaiah 49, read verse 25. Isaiah 49, read verse 25. Remember, you can trust God's word. He does not lie. Do you have it? Someone read for me verse 25 of Isaiah 49. But thus says the Lord, mm-hmm. even the captives of the mighty shall be taken away. Yes. And the prey of the terrible shall be delivered. Pause right there. What is the prey? What is prey? Say that again. Victims, Victims yes. Do you watch nature programs? Do you love to see safari? Uh -huh. What's the prey? The gazelle. Who is the a mighty? Uh-huh, uh-huh, uh, lion. Now, read that verse again. I will keep this in mind. Read that again, my dear sister. Say of the Lord. Mm -hmm. Now, captives and mighty are the same as, keep reading now. Yes, captive and mighty, same thing as prey and terrible. God is saying, I will deliver the gazelle from the jaws of the lion. Now, who is the gazelle? Keep reading. I will fight those lions, uh huh. I will save your gazelles from the jaws of the lion, your children. I, but God needs your cooperation. Now, let me say something that's hard. Your parents, you've got to ask yourself did I in any way contribute to their departure? You, now, that's not easy. Are you following me? It is not easy. Did I in any way contribute to the departure of my child from the church by my example? And if you think the answer is yes, Father, I'm sorry. And if there's one thing God does in a flash, what's that? He forgives. <laughs> so that's a very uncomfortable thing to do. Did I in and ask them? Mm -hmm, I'm sorry. I know sorry can be painful. You can't change the past, but that's why there's forgiveness. So look, I was not what I should be as a parent. Come on back. And you're asking God to do something he loves to do. He is not willing that any should perish. So what the Bible says, and this is the confidence that we have in him. If we ask anything according to his will, finish the verse. He heareth us. Is it God's will to save people? Yes. Remind him of that. Mm. Admit you're wrong and remind him. And God will do everything possible to save somebody. So that's a prayer request of the Tyler. Somebody else, prayer request. Yes, Sister Angelique. Salvation of your family. Say that again. Salvation of your family, your friends, your neighbors. All right. 1 Timothy 2 verse 4 says, He will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. That's God's desire. Somebody else. Yes, sister. Uh huh. A school. When you say you're working on, what do you mean? Yes. Okay. All right. Okay. 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 Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Train up a child in the way it should go. Yes, it is. And Ella White writes. She says Solomon didn't say tell a child. Solomon said. Train a child, that's where L.Y. writes. And she puts it in italics. Train, don't just tell. Train. Mm -hmm. Somebody else. Yes, my brother. 
Yes, yes. They're suffering. Biblical ramifications? Well, there are wars and rumors of wars. Well, they, we live in a world of sin. Even good people suffer. You see, we live in a world of sin. Always remember that God created a perfect world. Are you with me? He put Adam in it. He said, Adam, here's the world. No war, no sickness, no disease, no COVID-19, no divorce, nothing now. If you want this to remain, do what? Oh, baby. You see that tree? Leave it alone. You see these? Eat from them. What did Adam do? Mm-hmm. So why is this suffering in the world? Did God send suffering? Who brought suffering? We did. But God is merciful. God made an arrangement to finally bring suffering to an end. Yes, suffering has to happen. You see, we must stop thinking of salvation from our point of view. I was listening to the Sabbath school this morning. I want to say something, but I said, no, no, no. Let me not stick my nose in. We're talking about trials and tribulations to perfect character. The reason, let's listen to the, Lord, the, the psalm. We read Psalm 23. Listen to it. Say it with me. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He do what? Leadeth me beside the still water. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Now, let's think about that. What are the paths of righteousness? God's will. What is God's will? What's God's will? Yes, his word is general. I want to be more specific. What is God? Go to Romans 2. I want you to get it. I don't want to tell you. You must get it. Romans chapter 2. Let's read from verse 17. It's a 25 to 4. Nobody has to go to work. But I still want to practice temperance in all things, so please don't panic. Romans 2. Do you have that? Not yet. Let's read from verse 17. Now read microscopically. We're asking, the, what are the, what's the question we're trying to answer? What is God's will? Don't tell me you forget so quickly. You forgot so quickly. Now, let's read. Behold, from verse 17. Behold, thou art called a Jew. Come on. And restest in the law, and makest thy boast of God. Keep reading. And knowest his... Now, careful. You know his will. Keep reading. And approvest the things that are more excellent. Finish the verse. Being instructed. Yes. His will, yeah, sister, bless you. I like you, sister. His will is his law. His law. It is, the law is for heaven and earth. Now, say the Lord's Prayer with me. Which are in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. And God's will is his law. It's done in heaven. Listen to Psalm 103, verse 20. Bless the Lord, ye his angels that excel in strength, that do his commandments. The angels obey the same commandments. God's will is his law. Are you following me? Now, Satan accused God of having a law that cannot be kept. Servant of the Lord makes that very clear to us. The basic charge Satan had against God, you have an unfair law that cannot be kept. Hmm? And Satan proved it all through history. When Adam fell, Satan said, see? Hmm? When Abraham married Hagar, see? <laughs> when Cain killed Abel, see? When Solomon married two million women, see? He kept saying, see, see, I told you what, your law cannot be kept. God sent Jesus in our form. Now, God had a chance after thousands of years to say what? See. <laughs> huh? It can be kept. But the Bible says you need two witnesses. In the mouth of two, or th Jesus is one witness. This is the Jewish system. So even though God said, see, because the devil had a lot of people upon whom he could say, see, 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 including me. 
God had one. Jesus. He needs one more to fulfill the Jewish requirements by law. He needs one more. That one more has to be the church. So God can finally say, I have two witnesses. And God can say, see and see. When that happens, God will be cleared of wrongdoing. I'm saying all of that because I said we must stop seeing the gospel from our point of view. Do you know angels don't understand the gospel fully? Do you know the servant of law tells us it was only at Calvary that some angels finally broke off all sympathy with Satan? Up until then, they thought he had been unfairly treated. You're saying, mm, are you following me? They were unfallen angels who had questions about God's character and still in God's presence. God can't allow that to happen. He had to clear it up for them. Now, angels are higher than those on unfallen worlds. So can you imagine what was going on on unfallen worlds as they viewed God and how he treated Satan? God had to let sin continue so that the universe could be finally convinced that what? Sin is, come on, no good, no good. And Satan has always been wrong. Now go to Colossians 1. Let's read an interesting verse. Colossians 1. Colossians 1. I'm taking a long time to answer what my brother said. Why are you Ukrainian suffering? <laughs> Colossians 1. Read verse 20. Let's pray again. Father, this is the foundation of our teaching. Help me to speak clearly today, God, in Jesus' name. Amen. Colossians 1, someone read verse 20. And having made peace, and having made peace through the... Blood of his cross. Yes, now, peace. You make peace where there's what? Discord. 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 Yes, there's disagreement. Are you following me? So, Christ came to make peace. Keep reading. Stop. Why is reconciliation needed? There's a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a tug of war, yes. Christ came to about reconciliation between two opposing sides. Now listen carefully, keep reading. By him I say. Uh-huh. Ah. There are some things in heaven that needed reconciliation. Those are the angels who did not fully understand why God treated Lucifer the way he did, or Satan. Didn't understand. And as Ellen White tells us, only at the cross, when they saw what Satan did to Christ, they finally decided this guy is no good. Which means for thousands of years, there were angels watching God this way. And he had to endure that. This is expressed in the structure of the ark. Go to Exodus 25. Exodus 25. Let's read from verse 20. The details regarding the construction of the mercy seat. Exodus 25. Let's read verse 20. Then I'll get back to asking for more prayer requests. And the cherubim shall stretch forth their wings on high. Come on. Covering the mercy seat with their wings. Keep reading now. Listen carefully. Their faces shall look. Pause. Okay, keep reading. Toward the mercy seat shall the cherubim, faces of cherubim be. Now. Brother Carlos, come a minute, please. Read verse 20 again. Stand right there, Brother Carlos. You're one cherub. I'm another. That's the mercy seat right there. Okay, go ahead. All right. Wings up, wings up. Mm-hmm. And there's the mercy seat right here. We're covering it with our wings. Uh-huh. Go on. Now, it sounds as if their face, we're looking at each other, but keep reading. Ah. So they are facing each other, but looking where? Yes, they're looking down. Okay, thank you, Brother Carlos. God bless you. Now, why are they looking down? What does the mercy seat cover? 
the law. So we have mercy and justice. The angels don't understand how a just God can show mercy to lawbreakers and still be just. So, the, so the, 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 the structure symbolically tells us they, are, they want to understand now. Keep this in mind. Go to 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter 1. Let's read from verse uh, 10. Uh, verse 9. We read from 9 to 12. Uh, 1 Peter 1. You must tell me slow down. I get excited. I go too quickly. Just say slow down, slow down. And I'll be very, very happy. Do you have 1 Peter chapter 1? Reading from verse 9. All right, you have a cultural habit of not answering the preacher. Okay, I understand. I understand. God bless you. I understand. I still love you. You're still nice looking. It's okay. But there's some nice looking, quiet people. All right. Okay, First Peter chapter 1. Let's read from verse 9. What does that say? Receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation. But by the way, end of your faith doesn't mean the conclusion. It means what does faith lead to? The salvation of your soul. Keep reading. Of which salvation the prophets of what? Inquired and searched diligently who prophesied of the grace. Come on. That should come unto you. Carefully now, 11. Searching what? On what manner of time the spirit of Christ which was in them did signify when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. Now, the prophets were led by the spirit to write. They did not fully understand what they were writing. Are you with me? Because they were writing things that pertain to other people hundreds of years to come. Listen to verse 12. Keep reading now. And to whom it was revealed that not unto themselves, but unto us they did minister the things which are now reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven. Stop. Read carefully now. Which things the angels, come on, desire to look into. They want to understand. And the Greek word for look into is the same word for stoop down. Get a close look. They want to understand. They do not understand everything. Go to Ephesians 3. Let's read from verse 9 of Ephesians 3. We're proving the point angels do not understand everything. You have Ephesians 3. Reading verse 9, read for me someone. Come on, somebody read. And to make all men see, what is the fellowship, come on, of the mystery, which from the, had been, who created all things. Now, listen to the next verse carefully, verse 10. To the intent, that, what do you understand by to the intent? For this purpose or this reason, yes. Here's the reason. Keep reading. Uh huh. And powers in heavenly place mm -hmm, might be known by the church, the manifold wisdom of God. Now, who are the principalities and powers in heavenly places? Angelic beings. They will understand the gospel as it works in the church. So, in, in a very real sense, you are a classroom for the angels. Mm hmm. As they see the gospel changing your lives, they begin to understand. Angels do. Now, they're very powerful people. Don't misunderstand me. But you remember, the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. We will study that for all eternity. There's no greater mystery than the gospel. Now, God has been falsely accused. Angels finally concluded Satan was wrong, Christ was right. Are you following me? Let's go to Philippians chapter 2. Let's read verse 11. Philippians 2 verse 11. You know this verse well. And that every, every tongue shall confess, come on, that Jesus Christ is Lord. Finish that verse. To the glory of God the Father. The ultimate purpose is the vindication of the name of God which has been dirtied and sullied and muddied by Satan. It has taken all this time for God to demonstrate that his way is the better way and sin is a terrible choice to make. It has taken him this long. Why? 
Because when all of us are finally convinced, the conviction must be so strong that iniquity will never, ever come back again. Are you following me? It has taken so that Ukrainians suffer. People suffer in Yemen. They suffer in other places. All over the world, people are suffering, including children of God. Children of God were eaten by lions in the Roman Colosseums. Mm -hmm. And the, 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 the unfallen worlds could see what sin does. There's something, there's some diseases, you have to let them do what? Run their course. Are you following me? Let it run its course before this healing. Sin is like that. So that all the universe, including Satan, will finally confess that God was always right. When that happens, new heaven, new earth. Until then, we'll suffer. Good and bad. But God never originated suffering. Suffering entered this world because people disobeyed God. So we have to clear God's name. Now, Lord's Prayer, the Lord, the shepherd psalm, he leadeth me in the paths of righteousness because that makes him look good. Oh, you didn't hear what I said. When you obey, God looks good. First, not you, God looks good first. In other words, God's glory is attached to my obedience. When I keep the commandments of God, he gets the first credit. He looks good in front of the entire universe. Then we're blessed. I'm trying to tell you, look at the gospel from God's point of view first. You and I are not the most important thing in the universe. It is God. And so Isaiah 43 verse 7, I have created him for my glory. My glory. Jesus lived to glorify the Father. If we suffer, the question is, will God be glorified? If the answer is yes, we suffer. Because God is our priority, not me. Go to uh, Acts chapter 20. Acts 20. Look at the attitude of the Apostle Paul. A very sterling example of a godly man. Acts 20. Let's read from verse 22. Says Angelique, you have that? Yes. Read for us, please. And now behold, mm -hmm. I go bound in the spirit of Jerusalem. Yes. Not knowing the things that shall Now, now he knows he's going into trouble. He knows that. He doesn't know the details. He knows his life is in danger. Keep reading. Save Only. Mm-hmm. Holy Ghost witnesses mm -hmm. everything, saying that bonds and afflictions abide me. Just suffering. Go on. But none of these things. Ah, pause. Paul says, look, I'm heading for danger, but I've been sent by God. None of these things bother me. Because his first concern wasn't him, it was God. Keep reading. None of these things move me. Neither. Neither come I my life here. Aha, stop. What is he saying? Come on, don't hesitate. What's he saying? My life is not the most important thing to me. Keep reading. Ah, which means to work for God effectively, my life cannot be my most possession, precious possession. It will get in the way of doing God's work. Now, this is very harsh, but it's true. If I am numero uno in my life, it will interfere with the gospel. Because all the devil has to do is threaten my life, and I back off from God's word. Paul said, I do not count my life dear to me. What was dear to me? His ministry. For Paul, the work of God was first. What I'm saying to you and to me, in the gospel, in the work of God, God must be first. That calls for daily surrender to God because we are genetically programmed to put us first. You know, there's a law of grammar which says, when you mention yourself and someone else, mention the other person first. In other words, my husband and I. But it's almost impossible to get people to do that. What do they say? Me and my husband. Why? I must come first. Me and my dog. Me and my cat. It's impossible to get people to say, my husband and I. Because you've got to put your... That's the proper grammatical way to say it. The other person first. But that goes against our genetic uh, information. No, you first. But in the gospel, so the reason why this suffering brother, because God is letting sin run its course for a universal reason. One, that his name will be cleared. 
And two, that all created beings will realize that God has always been right. Remember, all our Bible study is done under the umbrella of the great controversy, which is a battle between Christ and Satan. Every choice to obey supports God's side. Every act of disobedience supports the devil's side. All right, let's get back finally to prayer requests. Anything at the end of me, pray in the light of what we see happening in our lives, which is perilous times. Any other prayer requests? Yes. Yes, 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 yes. Why are you worried? But the perfection you have to express is the perfection of Christ in you. Let me deal with that. Let me pray. Father, this is a serious topic. Talk to me, please, clearly. In Jesus' name, amen. Go to Psalm 19. Psalm 19. Someone read for me. It's a verse you know well. Verse 17 of Psalm 19. The law of the Lord is perfect. The law of the Lord is perfect. Now, if God has a perfect law, and obeying his law is the whole duty of man, what kind of life does God want? A perfect life. Are you thinking with me? A perfect life is the only standard God wants. Bible Commentary, Volume 6, page 1072, paragraph 8, I think it is, Ellen White writes, Why cannot those who claim to understand the Scriptures see that God's requirement under grace is just the same He made in even perfect obedience to His law? You see, God cannot change His standards. If he changes his standard, he's telling us his character has changed. Now, yes? Huh? What verse? What word did I say? For what? Of what verse? Of what book? Psalm 19.7. What did I say? Forgive my sins. Oh, sorry, sir. Verse 7, verse 7. Oh, that's what, oh, you were lost, uh, I tell you. It's a terrible thing when a preacher leads God's people astray. All right, Psalm 19, 7. Now, the law of the Lord is perfect. Now, what is perfect obedience? Hmm? Let me ask you this. If you sin once in your life, have you rendered perfect obedience? No. no. Now, how many times did Christ sin? No. None. Did he sin in the past? No. Did he sin in the present? No. Will he sin in the future? No. That's perfect obedience. Now, every human being has sinned at least once. You've fallen short. Are you following me? Now, when you fall short, it means here's the standard, here you are. God has a choice. He can raise you up or... Lord, a standard. What does God do? Through Christ. Now, God sent Jesus. Jesus lived a perfect life of conformity to his Father's law. And the Bible tells us, the Gospel says, if you accept Christ as your Savior, the same way he takes your sin, which he didn't commit, you take his Righteousness, which you didn't create. It's a swap. It's a swap. What a deal. What a deal. You know, let's make a deal. That old game show. What a deal. But let the Bible make it more clear. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Let's read verse 21. And the more I talk, the more tired I get. So when this is over, I'm going straight to sleep. You know, preaching gets you tired. But you have to preach truth. When you preach error, you're never tired. You know, you don't <laughs> Preaching error doesn't get you tired. Preaching truth takes all your energy. What book did I say? 2 Corinthians, what chapter? 5. I didn't say verse 17, I said verse 21. <laughs> okay. Do you have verse 21? Someone read it for me who's not yet read. 
Sister Tyler, read for us. For he hath... Wait a minute, start again. All right, that's not my version, but I understand. Okay, listen carefully to the King James Version. For he hath made him stop. Who is he? No, God. For he hath made him. Now, who's him? Jesus. Uh huh. Notice the word made. Someone made Jesus. Sin. He hath made him to be sin for us. Why did someone have to make Jesus sin? Couldn't Jesus make himself sin? Yes. Just by sinning. Mm, but he didn't. Are you with me? Someone else had to make him sin. Because he never chose now that we might be made, come on, the righteousness of God now. Why does someone have to make us righteous? Because we can't make ourselves righteous. It's a swap again, a deal. So we have the word made used twice. Do you see the word made in that verse? Come on, look at the word. Do you see made twice? Okay. Do you see two opposites? Sin, what's the other one? Righteousness. Now, here's sin. That's where we belong. Are you with me? Here's righteousness. Who belongs there? Christ. Sin, that's us. Righteousness, Christ. And God says, let me switch. There's nothing these sinners can do because they've sinned once to save themselves. What I'll do, I will make them righteous. But for me to do that, I will have to make my son a sinner. Now keep in mind, my son never chose to sin. I will make him a sinner. I'll put your sin on him because he has never sinned. You have never done righteousness. I will put his righteousness on you. And so Ellen White writes in Steps to Christ, page 62, paragraph 2, if you give yourself to him, what does that mean? If you give yourself to Christ, who owns you? Christ. Mm -hmm. Not if you loan yourself. If you give yourself to him and accept him as your savior, savior from what? Sin. So you've done two things. Look, you acknowledge you're a sinner. You give your life to Christ. Then, sinful though your life may have been, Christ's character stands in place of your character. God accepts you the way he would accept Christ. And you are accepted before God just as if you had never sinned. Now that's the sort of thing that's too good to be true. But it's true. If you give yourself to him and accept him as your savior, then sinful though your life may have been, his character stands in place of your character. And you're accepted before God just as if you had never sinned. The same way Christ was treated as if he had sinned. Are you with me? Yeah. The Father cursed him on the cross. Galatians 3 verse 13. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law. Who cursed him? The Father. Because the Father saw a sinner on the cross. What did Jesus say? My God, my God. Yeah, the Father turned away from sin. That he may turn to us. The father can't turn to one sin. He turns towards righteousness. So all sin must be on Jesus. But you must accept him as your savior and give your... That's why the perfection God requires of you is the perfection of Christ that's credited to you when you give yourself to him. And that must be a permanent gift renewed every day because the carnal nature will not die until this mortal puts on immortality and so it is a constant battle the flesh lusts against the spirit the devil wants to take yourself back from christ a daily surrender let me tell you again the gospel is what god has done to make you perfect and fit for heaven fit for angels fit to walk with god himself fit to talk to God face to face. How can you have one sin and talk to God face to face? Adam committed one sin and there was a barrier between him and God. One. If that's the case, how can God let you in with one? 
perfection, but it is the perfection of Christ. Now, here's what Ellen White says in Faith and Works, page 50, paragraph 1. When it is in the heart to obey God, when efforts are put forth toward this end, Christ accepts this disposition and effort as our best service, and he makes up for the deficiency with his own divine merit. <laughs> ah. You know, you come to Christ, you realize what a nice person Christ is, and you're trying to do what's right. You're trying. And the Lord knows with all your trying, you can't do it by yourself. Wherever you come short, he covers you. Huh? You're in good hands. <laughs> with all of heaven. Not all state, all heaven. That's a remark. When you understand it, you start to jump. I mean, you don't go crazy, but you jump. <laughs> Are you with me? Ah, it's a remarkable thing that God will cover you with his righteousness simultaneously covering Christ with your sins. Giving to Christ what he never deserved and giving to me what I never deserved. But you have to give your life to Christ. You see, Christ gave himself to you by becoming human. You give yourself to him and he'll make you godly. You can never become God, but you must be godlike. So because the Bible says, let us make man how? In our image, that's the standard, we go back to that. Uh, okay, any other prayer requests? Oh, the youth, the youth, oh yes, yes, yes. Let me tell you something about the youth. You want them here? Where are they? Yes, but which youth? Which youth do you mean? You mean that belong to Adventist people? Why are they not here? Okay, all right. Let me tell you something about the youth. <laughs> it's a very serious thing. The last organ in the body to develop is the brain. The last one. The experts say it develops between 25 and 30, fully developed. Until then, it's underdeveloped. Now, the development of the brain occurs from the back to the front. Are you with me? The last part to develop and the last organ to develop is the frontal lobe. With judgment and decisions and empathy, those kind of things, and measuring risk, and ha that's where it's done. It's the last thing that matures. So you have a 14-year-old boy who can impregnate a girl. And what kind of brain does he have? Undeveloped. Are you following? Are you listening to me? Here's a 14-year-old boy who can father a child. Here's a 13-year-old girl who can get pregnant. And, uh, and people say, leave the youth alone. The youth needs supervision. Are you following me? They need supervision. But the most Powerful supervision is an example that's consistent. If there's one thing young people pick up, it's hypocrisy. Mm -hmm. They have an antenna for hypocrisy. They don't say anything. They just watch. When they're old enough, they escape it. If <laughs> I, you can play around with adults, you cannot play around with children. They're designed by God to pick up hypocrisy. So they need our help very badly. They need our help. Do you know why insurance rates are so high for young people? Not because they're bad. They don't have the capacity fully developed to judge risk and danger. Let me tell you something. If a boy between 15 and 19 is driving a car, let's say there's a 40% chance he'll have an accident just because of who he is. Not because the car has three wheels. No, just because of who he is now. If another teenager enters that car, the risk goes up by 10% to 50%. This has been studied. If another teenager enters, it goes up to 60%. For every other teenager that enters that car, the risk of that. Why? Because young people like to show off in the presence of other young people. Mm -hmm. Not because they're bad, because they're immature. And they function with an undeveloped brain. We have to step in. But the greatest power to help them is not us, it's this. There has to be a power that makes up for an undeveloped brain, and that is the power of God. Amen. So, sister, when you say the children, yes. Mm-hmm. Oh, yes. 
And the devil, you know, the Bible says, remember now the creator in the days of thy youth. The devil says the same thing, remember me in the days of thy youth. Because the devil knows if he gets them young, he can keep them forever. I was a Catholic when I was a little boy. I was an altar boy serving with a priest. And the Catholics had a saying back then, give me a child for the first seven years, I'll give you a Catholic for life. Mm-hmm. L.O.I. says 50% of the character of a child is developed by the age three. 50%. <laughs> so if you don't work fast, you can bend the tree when it's young. A lot of us try to bend the tree when it's sick. Oh, you can't do that. The, the, the prison system will break it for you. The youth need help. But they need help that's consistent and couched in love. And the only power that can deliver them of any age, really, is the power of God. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's so many allurements in the world that catch the attention of so many things. It's a... I thank God I didn't grow up in this age. These are the last days. They're terrible times. But prayer is powerful and an example. Young people write me all the time. I want to do right. I want to do right all the time. How do I, do, how do I serve God? They want to. Any other prayer request? Yes, my dear sister. Okay, all right. Okay, all right. The schools? <laughs> ah, schools. Yeah, let me not talk about schools. We pray for the schools. If you can keep your children out of public schools, keep them out. That's all I'll say. Keep them out. Keep them out. Because once things get into their heads, you can't get them out. Children are at an age where they're learning and they learn fast. They absorb things fast. They're very impressionable. We have to exert them to the right impression. You put your child in a public school, the last thing they'll find out about is Jesus. Are you with me? They'll come back after three weeks. You'll wonder, is this my child? Yes, it's your child. Mm-hmm. We talk about life and death, eternal life or eternal loss. Very serious business. I have no children, as I said. If I had, I would not release my child to the world until he or she had finished high school in my house. Homeschooled. And Daniel and the three Hebrew boys, they went to Babylon, they had gotten the right foundation. They remained strong. You know, God made parents. Parents invented nannies. You heard what I said? You didn't hear what I said. God made parents. Parents invented nannies. Let someone else raise my child. I'm pursuing a degree. I, have to, I need time. Mm -mm. You brought it into the world, you raise it. Let me get off that before you riot. <laughs> Next prayer request. Yes, my lovely sister. Yes, with the schools. Uh huh. Oh, sister. Gender. Let me. Let's go to Genesis 1. Oh, sister, that's a big problem. When I was a boy, there was male, female. Today, there's a whole list. And I don't mean to be insensitive, but this LG thing keeps getting longer and longer and longer. Do you have Genesis 1? Let's read from verse 26. Are you there? Read with me. What does it say? And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle, over all the earth, over every living, creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. Next verse. So God created man in the image of God. Read now. Male and female created he them. Stop. What color was Adam's hair? Does the Bible say? How tall was he? What was the texture of his skin? What was the shape of his nose? How tall was Eve? What's the only physical thing you know? One was male, one was female. That's it. Now, that must be important to God. The color of the skin wasn't important. He didn't tell us that. He told us one is a male, one is a female. That's it. Today, you say that from certain places, you are persecuted. 
you call this phobic and that phobic. In other words, what's right is now frowned upon as uh, whatever. And so when my sister says this gender thing, it was always God's will that there be no confusion. That's a male, that's a female. Many of our young people are confused. And so they start choosing incorrectly. People choose to be whether they're male or female. Are you following me? They choose. There's some places you can't use he and she. By law, you cannot say he or she. It's a strange world in which we live. And I'm not being insensitive, I'm just reporting the facts. You're gender fluid, you're binary, you, you this, you... You're mad a woman on Tuesday, you're a woman on Wednesday, I, I, I don't get it. I just don't get it. But that's the world in which we live. And the Christian cannot absorb that. Yes, we must be forgiving and merciful, all of that, without one iota of God's law compromised. Because we're celebrating today the things God destroys Sodom and Gomorrah for. That's what we celebrate today. All right, prayer request. Okay, all right, okay. Illness. Ella White writes in the Tsar of Ages, page 823, paragraph 4, Christ is just as willing to heal today as when he was personally on the earth. But let me tell you, the number one, what's the, what, what is the, the number one health law? What are the eight laws of health? What's the eight laws of health? <laughs> you know what they are, you know, uh, what's the sunshine, uh, nutrition, trust in God, temperance, exercise, fresh air, water, whatever. The, most, the number one law of health is to be right with God. Ellen White writes, the consciousness of right doing is the most important requisite to health. He that is a peace of God has, 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 has uh, achieved the most important contribution to his own health. The consciousness of right doing is the number one health law, which means get rid of sin. Read uh, Exodus 15, 26. Somebody read that for me. Exodus 15, 26. Exodus 15, 20. Who wrote Exodus? Moses. Who wrote the book of Acts? Luke. Luke, not Paul. Luke. What other book did Luke write? Luke, yes. <laughs> Luke. <laughs> okay, sister, I tried to trick you. It didn't work. Okay. Exodus 15. Someone read verse 26. We're talking about illness. Read now. Nice and clear. And said... Okay, pause, pause this, Angelique. I want one word for, listen to me carefully, give me one word for, diligently hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God. Ten words, give me one word for that. Obey. Obey. Keep reading. And? How many words are those? And will do that which is right in his sight. Ten more words, give me one word for that. Obey. Keep reading. Okay, pause. And will give ear to his commandments. Seven words. Give me one word for that. Mm -hmm. Keep reading. And keep all his statutes. One word. What's the first law of health then? Obey God. Mm -hmm. Now finish the verse. Ah. Upon you. Uh huh. Yes. That healeth thee. But what's the condition? Eloise says, all sickness comes from sin. Now, it may not be sin you've committed. It may simply be living in a sinful world. All sickness is, I've often said, I'll say it again, people don't die of cancer, heart attack, they die of sin. Mm -hmm. Because you take away sin, there's no sickness. You understand what I'm trying to say? The reason people die is sin. Sickness is a consequence. We die because of sin. 
When God said, in the day thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely get sick. Is that what he said? No, thou shalt surely die. But people got sick. The land got hard. The trees produced thorns. Women had hard childbirth. All of that happened. All of that are expressions of a dying world. The number one law of health is obey me. And if God doesn't cure, he'll give improvement. He has to. God doesn't like sickness. But again, sickness is another way God lets the universe see sin is no good. See what sin does? They have to see. They have to see. But God is merciful. And so, <laughs> people tell me, I'm sick, I'm not coming to church. Mistake. Unless you're really seriously ill, come to church. Because Christ healed using the word. When you put yourself in the presence of the word, it has a healing effect on you. Mm, just come to where the healing word is preached. And see what happens to you. You leave home feeling better. But people stay home and just get worse. Okay, other prayer request. Thank you very much. God bless you. For those of you who are curious, a brother asked me if I wanted some water. Okay. Yeah. Huh? Yes, sister. Yes, yes, yeah. Now, what, what kind does she have? Okay, all right. God loves her, wants to save her. And that's very serious. It's amazing. Yes. That's it? Okay, your mother. Anything else? This church. This church. Is there a sister church to this? Yes. What's it called? Northwest. Oh, Northwest. Northwest. Northwest and Hammond. Are you the bigger of the two? No, they are. They are. So you're a little brother to Northwest. Or a little sister or a little cousin. Okay. Anything else? Yes, sister. I have a brother who left the church. Okay. Um, because of a bad relationship, he ended the board. Ah. Uh, that tore him apart. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, okay, okay. And for our sister who was just recently baptized a couple minutes ago. Okay, oh, okay, all right, okay. He holds her up. Yes. Okay. Let me ask you this now. This is embarrassing. Do you still want me to ask you? Okay. This side said nothing. <laughs> Not as bad as you think. All right, listen to me carefully. Is there someone you need to forgive? Don't answer me. And you know it. It has been a while. You have not forgiven. Do it today. You don't have to feel like doing it. Obedience does not require feeling. The Bible says thou shalt not kill. I don't care how you feel. Are you with me? All right. Is there someone you need to forgive? Don't answer me. If the answer is yes, when we pray, include that in the prayer. Let me tell you why. Go to Matthew 6. Read verse 14 and verse 14 for me. Sister Angelique, you've been very faithful reading. Someone else helps Sister Angelique. And read for me. My handsome brother right here. Read for us. Matthew 6, 14 and 15. Listen carefully. Uh huh. Pause. Do you understand that? There's a condition for God's forgiveness. What's that? Forgive, forgive people. Keep reading. But if ye forgive not men their trespasses, mm -hmm. neither will your Father forgive yours. So where are you headed? Where are you headed? If God doesn't forgive you, where are you headed? Mm -hmm. And the person you haven't forgiven is right with God. <laughs> he is going this way, and you're going that way. Now you tell me what sense that makes. You know, when you don't forgive, you know, there's a negative power that comes from holding a grudge. It props you up. But only so the devil can see you more clearly, that's all. There's a negative power that comes from, I have a grudge. And he took away my girlfriend twice, so I have a grudge. Hurting whom? Yourself. The Bible says if you do not forgive effectively, you're lost. Why commit suicide? Forgive. Forgive. Now. Is there someone to whom you ought to apologize? Don't answer me. 
And I'm asking this because, you know, churches, we want to win people, but something is wrong on the inside. Are you with me? There's a lot of stuff under the rug, but we're trying to win people to come stand on the rug. Mm -mm. Let's clean the church. Let's clean the church. Then we're empowered to go win people. If there's someone you need to forgive, make up your mind to forgive that person. I don't, it makes no difference how you feel. If there's someone you need to apologize to, do that. If God requires it, do it. After you do it, the good feeling will come, but do it. Obedience is not attached to how you feel. Faith has nothing to do with feeling. It's based on thus saith the Lord. You haven't been returning a tithe. Make up your mind to do it. The Bible says you're cursed with a curse. Even this whole nation. Some of us live under a curse. Go to, go to Malachi chapter 3. Is it Malachi 3? No. Um, Haggai. Haggai chapter 1. Let's go to Haggai 1. Let's see what some of us are going through. You have Haggai chapter 1. Let's read from verse 1. Somebody read for us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In the sixth month. Mm -hmm. The month. Mm -hmm. Word of the Lord by Shealtiel and to Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, pause. We're looking at a time when the Jews had come back to rebuild Jerusalem, but then they had stopped. They stopped rebuilding the walls and the temple. They had stopped. Now they were focusing on themselves. You see, keep reading. This people say, it's not come. Mm -hmm. Yes, they stopped building the temple. They're trying to establish themselves. Keep reading. Lord, mm -hmm. is it time for you, O ye, to dwell in your sealed houses? Now, they had built houses with high ceilings. You know, we love high ceilings, chandelier hanging. So God said, look, is it time for you to dwell in your sealed houses and this house lie waste? Mm -hmm. By the way, your house should not look nicer than the church. Is this mic working? <laughs> the church cannot look like a dump and your house looks nice. Something's wrong. I'm not saying your house should look like a dump. I'm saying God first. Verse 5, now therefore, thus said the Lord, consider your ways. Stop. What does that mean? Huh? Consider your ways. What's that? Think of what you're doing. Hmm? You join the gym to lose weight. Three months later, you're 50 pounds heavier. Think of what you're doing. Are you with me? Oh, you're not listening. You don't like me. <laughs> hmm? Think, God says, think. Keep reading. Verse 6. Pause. You're working hard, but you can't see why you're working, what you're working for. You have sown much, but bring in little. Come on. You eat, but you have not enough. Come on. You drink, not filled with drink. Mm -hmm. You clothe you. There's none warm. Now, pause. Take a deep breath. Finish that verse. And he that earneth wages, earneth wages to put it into a bag, withholds. Have you ever, where did my money go? <laughs> There's a hole in your pocket. Who put the hole there? God. Until you recognize God has claims on you. In everything, God must be first. He that earneth wages, earneth wages to put it into a bag with holes. You get paid on Tuesday, and on Wednesday, you have to borrow money. Why? Because you put God second. This is no joke. Many of us are in financial crisis because God is not first. We want this and that and that. Things that will burn when Jesus comes. But not the character. We don't spend time on that. Mm -mm. That can't make me look nice in front of my friends. Mm -mm. House, car, land, plane, boat. These things that perish. The thing that does not perish gets little attention. I preached a sermon once called Miles and Inches. This is this present life. This. That's an inch. 
Eternal life, that's a mile. Most of our energies are focused on this. Then we try to fool God into thinking we're preparing for this. It makes no sense. Most of our energies are on this, this life. It's the grass. It's up today, gone tomorrow. Eternal life, which is this. No time. The Bible says the heart is deceitful above all things. The first person it deceives is the person who has it. <laughs> Are you with me? That's you and me. In everything you do, God, and I'm, I'm telling you so many things at once, but put God first. Should you try to buy a house? Yes. Should you get clothes? Yes. Food? Yes. But how should you pursue that? Go to Matthew 6. Matthew, uh, all right, Matthew 6. Let's read from 25. Do you have Matthew 6? As usual, nobody answered the preacher. I am not coming back to Hammond. All right. <laughs> Matthew 6. <laughs> Let's read from verse 25. When you find that, say amen. Read with me. Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what you shall eat, nor what you shall drink, nor yet for your body what you shall put on. Now, finish that verse carefully. Is not the life more than meat and the body than raiment? What does that mean? Isn't there something more to life than Gucci bags? And what's the shoe? Louboutin, Louboutin, Loubou something? Huh? Isn't there something more to life? than possessions. That's what Christ is asking us. Is not the life more than meat and the body than raiment? He doesn't say the life does not include meat. He says, isn't there something more? Verse 26, come on. Behold the fowls of the air. They sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are ye not much better than they? Come on. And which of you, by taking thought, or why take, why take ye thought for Raymond? Behold, it, this, uh, the, the, the lilies of the field, verse 29. What does that say? They sow not, they toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon, come on, in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Now, who dresses the flowers? God. Who feeds the birds? Jesus said, look, if God feeds the birds, aren't you better than birds? You see God reasoning with us? Aren't you better than a bird? Were birds made in the image of God? No. no. Were you? Yes. Then who has priority? You. Read verse 30. Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you? Finish the verse now. O oh, ye of little faith. Verse 31. Therefore, take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? Now pause. Eat, drink, clothe. Now, for after all these things, come on. Ah. The Gentiles seek these things, and there's nothing wrong, but they seek them in a certain order. Christ now will give the order for the Christians. Keep reading, verse 32. For your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. He knows that. Now, 33. Ah. Uh, mm hmm. Now, read the first part of verse 32. For after all these things do the. You see the word seek? The Gentiles seek. Read verse 33. Ah, wait a minute. So the Gentiles seek and the people of God seek. The difference must be the order in which you seek. God knows you need food, clothes, shelter. He knows that. The order of seeking is the problem with the Gentile. The Gentile seeking is not a problem. The order, they place those things ahead of God. God says, no, place me ahead of them. That's it. Mm -hmm. But that takes daily practice because it is not in the nature of a sinner to put anybody first. So it requires constant practice to put God first. 
Any other prayer requests? Uh, each prayer request generates a little sermon, but any prayer request? Any other? Yes, Brother Carlos. Uh huh. Okay. Okay. Let's look at that. Let's look at that. Okay, praying for the Holy Spirit. Go to Matthew 11. Matthew 7, sorry. Matthew 7. Now, the Holy Spirit, there's no topic more important than the Holy Spirit. Are you with me? So let me pray. Father, I am talking about the one whom, if we blaspheme him, there's no forgiveness. Give me the right words, I pray. Let that same spirit speak through me to your beloved people. In Jesus' name, amen. Matthew 7, read verse 11. Uh-huh. Know how to give good gifts unto your children. How much more, huh? Show your father who is in heaven. Give good things. Ah. Now, what are the good things? Does the verse tell us? Does the verse tell us what the good things are? No. It simply says, if a sinful person can accurately determine what's best for their children. What about a God who has no sin? Can he decide what's best for his children? The answer is yes. Now, Matthew doesn't tell us what the good things are. The same verse is quoted by Luke. He makes a little change. Go to Luke 11. Luke 11. Brother Luke was a medical doctor. He was not one of the 12 disciples. Which other gospel writer was not one of the 12 disciples? Mark. Mark. Very good. Very good. Sister, you passed with an A for Adventist. All right. Do we have Luke 11? Let's read verse 13. What does that say? Now, remember, it's the same verse Matthew quotes in Matthew 7, 11. Luke makes a small change. Keep reading now. If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the... Ah, to them that Matthew says good things. Luke identifies one. Of all the good things God can give, and he identifies the Holy Spirit. Now, Brother Carlos said, you're praying for the Holy Spirit to fall on you. Wait a minute now. There are conditions. Condition one, what is that? You just read it. Yeah. Ask. Let's look at condition two. It's easy to ask. It's just words. Go to Acts chapter 5. Two books away from Luke. Written by the same man. Do you have Acts 5? Read verse 32. We are of these things, and so is. Uh huh. It's given to them that. Ah. What's another condition? Obey. Actually, obedience is a condition for all of God's blessings. So we have ask, and you say, well, that's easy. May I have the Holy Spirit, please? God said, wait a minute, there's another condition. Obey. Obey in what areas? All. All. Let's look at another condition. Go to Acts chapter 2. Acts 2. Read verse 37, verse 38. Very popular verses, you're well known. Now when they heard this, pricked in their heart, mm -hmm, and said unto Peter, rest of the apostles, men and brethren. Now this is the sermon on the day of Pentecost, powerful sermon. And Peter pauses in the sermon. The people say, what are we supposed to do? This is a good question. When God knocked Paul off his horse, he said, what am I to do? Read verse 38. Listen to Peter and the other men. Read the whole verse. Come on, read the whole verse. Start from the beginning of 38. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Now, what's that other condition? Uh-huh. Be baptized. Is there someone who needs to be baptized? Don't answer me. We have three conditions we've identified. Number one. Come on, number one. 
Number two. Number three. Yeah, be baptized if you haven't been baptized. Now, let me give you another condition. You have to do some thinking. When we think of the Holy Spirit, how is the Holy Spirit represented by symbol? The, the rain. Okay, one symbol is the rain. But that rain has two phases. Name them. The latter rain and the early rain. Or early rain, latter rain. Which is greater? Latter rain. Now, how should we approach that? Go to Luke 16. Luke 16. While you're looking for Luke 16, let me ask you a question. A friend of mine wrote me and said, Randy, when you preach, you're very hard on your congregation. You're very hard on them. Is that true? No. Are you sure? Yes. Would you like a Mary had a little lamb presentation? No. Okay, 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 okay. All right. Okay. You can take it then. I like you for that. All right. What book did I say? Verse 10. Are you there? Someone read for me Luke 16, 10. He that is faithful in that which is, uh-huh, is faithful also in. Now, there are two key words there. What are those key words? Well, faithful is by itself, but least and much. Now, how did we divide the Holy Spirit when it is symbolized as rain? The early rain. Now look at least and much, okay, in Luke 16, 10. Where does the latter rain apply, the early rain apply? To least. Where would you put the latter rain? Much. Now, keep this in mind. He that is faithful in that which is? In other words, what are you doing now with the early rain? <laughs> Their church is praying for the latter rain. They're doing nothing with the early rain. You, an idle church cannot pray for the Spirit. What are you doing with the least, which is the early rain? That God can say, ah, I can trust them with the much, which is the latter rain. I was in Indonesia a few years ago, talking to some theology students. <laughs> I was taking some questions. This theology guy, he was a senior about to graduate. He said, uh, I don't understand the conference hasn't hired me yet. So I said, well, number one, the church is not an employment agency. The church doesn't exist to provide jobs. That's number one. Two, what evidence have you given the conference that would induce them to hire you? He said, what do you mean? I said, how many Bible studies are you conducting now? Are you offering your services to your local pastor? How many people have been baptized because of your outreach? He said, nothing. I said, then, why should any conference hire you? When you have given no evidence that you'd like to be a pastor. Nothing. And he kept quiet. In other words, your early rain activity is dead. Why should a conference bless you with a latter rain hiring? Mm -mm. What are you doing with the early rain? Why do you want the latter rain? If you're doing nothing now with the early rain, you'll do nothing with the latter rain. Actually, it won't come on you. That's why some people never understand the Bible, because God realizes you're not doing anything with what you already know. Why should I reveal more to you? Are you with me? I'm just giving you reasons to be guilty before me. Why should I reveal more truth when you're not obeying the truth you know? Mm -mm. Stay in your ignorance. Then you have less to suffer for. You want the latter rain? <laughs> okay. What are you doing? with the little that you have. Show God how you'll handle the latter rain by how you're handling the early rain. Who is conducting a Bible study? Don't tell me. How many have been baptized this year? Don't tell me. Do we have a list of people we visit? Don't tell me. Do we have a special ministry for those who've left the church to actively bring them back? Don't tell me. But you want the latter rain for what? You're sure I'm not too hard on you? Okay. Are you sorry I came? All right. Oh, okay. You look so depressed. Okay. <laughs> okay. Listen to me. Don't wait for a church to have an outreach program. You have your own outreach program. We wait too much on the church to... <laughs> A few years ago, I was in London. 
this lady was talking to me. And she's beating up on the AY program. The AY program has no program for my children. And they this, they that. So I said to her, sister, did the AY bring your child into the world? And she kept quiet. You want programs for your child? You provide them. AY is not a nanny. The purpose of AY is not to raise children. Or the school, by the way. Parents raise children. Not AY. And she kept quiet. What can you do when you want a boyfriend, you ask the church to help you? Huh? No. Am I talking the truth? Am I? Ah, you just go get one. And you know what to do. Lower your bus line, raise your hemline, and you go get a boyfriend. You know what to do. <laughs> huh? But you want the church to tell you how to win someone to Christ. No, 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 no. What can you do for God? Forget the church for a minute. And I say that very carefully. I hope you understand what I mean. What am I doing for God? I work somewhere. There are people in my office who are not Christians. Have I given the steps to Christ to anybody? Have I given a little track, a glow track? You've heard of glow tracks? Hmm? What have I done? I'm in school. My classmates are not Christians. What have I done? Everything cannot be organizational. Total member involvement, and then you get excited. No, no. You, you set up your own. Each one, reach one, that, that, let that be yours. Don't wait for the general conference. We sin without getting any help from the church. We want the church to help us to do everything else. Uh-uh. Mm-mm. Mm-mm. God made you. Now, I'm not saying the church doesn't have a work. It has a work. But some people hide under the church. The church has done nothing. The church is idle. No, you're idle. A busy person doesn't have time to criticize the church or one another. The greatest favor a church can do itself is get busy than all the gossiping and all the infighting styles because people have no energy for that. They're all concerned with the work of God. There's so many ways. Just invite someone to church. You don't need a degree for that. Just say, come. I've often said people are in graveyards because a friend said, let's do this. Are you following me? Or they're in prison because a friend said, let's do this. Or they're in rehabilitation programs because a friend said, let's smoke this. Just tell a friend, come to church and save a life. Don't wait for the church to have a program. Make yours. Next prayer request. Yes, whether you put the word reform on it or not, dress is a standard in the church. Go to Exodus 28. Exodus 28. Is it 28 or 29? 28, I think. I'll find out in a minute. I think it's 20. What does verse 2 of Exodus 28 say? Okay, there we have it. All right. Are you ready now? This is God telling Moses how to dress Aaron. Now, who is Aaron? High priest. Are we a kingdom of priests? Yes. yes. Okay. Who is Moses symbolically? Symbolically, Moses is God telling Aaron how to dress. Are you with me? You sure? Yes. Now, read verse 2 of Exodus 28. Holy garments for Aaron. Aha. Uh-huh. Nah. We have two standards for how to dress. What's standard one? Glory. What's standard two? So you don't have to look as though you fell off the back of a Salvation Army truck. Are you following me? You don't have to look like that. Are you with me? But you don't dress for, glory, for, for beauty. You dress for glory first. Do I look like a Christian? Hmm? When you go to buy your clothes, where you buy them? Walmart? When you go to buy your clothes, you don't, you don't do I look better than she does? Mm-mm-mm-mm. Do I look like a child of God? Then... God is the God of beauty. Is this attractive and appealing without being gaudy and flashy? Yes. For glory first, then for beauty. That was God's standard for the high priest. We are a kingdom of priests. So I don't have details for you, but dress is an expression of respect for God. It is an expression of worship. Eating is an expression of worship. Hmm. 
Let me say it again. Eating is an act of worship. Dress is an act of worship. Work is an act of worship. Ellen White writes, Christ's Object Lessons, page 349, paragraph 3. Religion and business are not two separate things. They are the same. So when God told Israel you'll be a holy nation, a holy nation has to be holy seven days a week, not just two hours on Sabbath. How does a holy person run a business? How does a holy person get out of the car when he's been rammed by someone else? Are you following me on the highway? How does a holy person handle that? There are no exceptions to living a holy life. Whether they for eat, come on, or drink, or buy clothes. Do all. I was talking to some young people a few years ago, and I said to the ladies, ladies, go to your wardrobe when you get home and open your closet. Maybe every room in your house is a closet for clothes. Just open them up. And then you say to yourself, which one of these did I buy for the glory of God? <laughs> and you may have to get rid of all of them. <laughs> I was at a church <laughs> preaching, and some ladies came out to do special music. I had never seen heels so high. Uh, I tell you, I, I often say when I tell the story, <laughs> when he's that high, you don't have to jump off a building to commit suicide. <laughs> jump off those shoes and you're dead. <laughs> Are you following me? <laughs> I mean the heels were high. <laughs> I thought those women were basketball players until I looked down. <laughs> mm. Now, were you thinking of God? No. Let me stop before you don't like me anymore. <laughs> Any other prayer requests? Yes, my dear sister. Yes. Adornments? All right, okay, adornments. Let's go to Genesis chapter 2. Now, we're not picking on anyone, we're just reading the Bible. Genesis 2. And by the way, church members are not policemen. Are you following me? You're not a policeman. Okay, I'll leave it at that. Don't go arresting members. <laughs> Genesis chapter 2. If read verse 25 for me. Who is that? Keep reading. Uh huh. How were they made? What was on them? What was in the air? What was hanging from the air when God made Adam and Eve? The nose. The eyebrow. The navel. Wherever people put metal. Nothing. Nothing. That's how God made them. When they dressed themselves, what did they wear? Aprons. When God dressed them, what did he give them? Coats. Coats are total coverings. That's a lesson for us. When you dress, cover yourself. You can fill in the details. Christians need principles. And the Holy Spirit will guide you through the details. When you dress, cover yourself. You take care of the rest. But the church can't tell you how many inches your hem should be. That's not the church's business. There's something called the Holy Ghost who convicts. Are you following me? And, you know, criticizing people is not a spiritual gift. People are convicted at different times in their lives. There are people who have gone a certain way, then the spirit hits them, they drop a certain thing. But some of us, we want them to drop it now. It doesn't work like that. Grow in grace. Are you with me? Grow in grace. There's some people, oh, come on, be righteous. <laughs> if I'm a child, give me a chance to grow. Be a vegetarian today. No. Mm -mm. You present a gospel message and let the spirit work on people. But remind people in all you do, the glory of God first. That's all. Anything else? I tell you, praying is such an important intervention strategy. Pray. Pray. If you don't know the person, let someone else talk to the person. By that I mean... 
one of the best foundations for intervening is friendship. There are people in the church, we don't pay any attention to them, but when we see them in a certain shoe, then we want to talk to them. Mm -mm. You're out of place. And the person has the right to put you in your place. Mm -mm -mm -mm. You've never spoken to me, never invited me to your home for some macaroni. Now you're trying to tell me my dress is too short. Mm -mm 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 -mm. Leave me alone. Leave me alone. Relationships are the best foundation for intervention. Relationships. Hmm? Christ, method. Christ method. You can't, you can't go around correcting everything. I mean, you're not a sin hunter. Are you following me? You're hunting sin. Eloise said those who hunt sins become like the things they hunt. Mm -hmm. So let the Spirit have some time with people, and you set an example. I was doing a crusade in a certain country, and a lady got baptized. I thought I talked about adornments. I had. Maybe I didn't make it clear. Anyway, um, she, someone wrote me and said, uh, this girl is wearing this and that. So I said, okay. I was the one who invited her, by the way, and baptized her. So I wrote and I said, um, I heard this. She said, it's true. But as I looked around the church and I noticed nobody wore anything, I took mine off. That's what she told me. She says, as I looked around, and I realized nobody wore it, I took it all off. That's one way God moves people to change, by observing others. There's some people who say, well, I looked around, everyone was smoking, so I started to smoke. Mm -hmm. The opposite is true. No one was doing it, so I took them all off, and she's never put them back on. That's been 20 years. The Holy Spirit can move on people. The greatest force is love. And when someone knows you love me, the person is willing to respond to your approach. It really is. But you can't go as a policeman who pulls people over and tells them, okay, let me ticket you for uh, eating chicken. Mm -mm, mm -mm, mm -mm, mm -mm. No, 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 no. All right. Any other question that's easy? Any simple request that does not require a sermon? Say that again. Yes, forgiveness. Yes. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, but oftentimes we might not speak, we might have forgiveness for trespass against us. Mm -hmm. We might not have forgiven somebody for trespass against someone else, like against our spouse, against our son, something like that. Somebody has done wrong, but do we suffer for the, the unforgiveness we have? We suffer when we don't forgive, regardless of the circumstance. You, you have to forgive. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Forgiveness, you decide to forgive regardless of how you feel. Now, doing right sometimes is painful. Mm -hmm. we, we, we want to do right with no pain. Forgiveness can be painful because this woman took your husband. Are you with me? You're required to forgive her because the greatest crime is not that a woman took your husband. The greatest crime is sin against God and God forgives. We must keep this in mind. The greatest crime is sin against God and God forgives. So we, give in the light, we forgive in the light of God's forgiveness. We think what people do to us is the greatest crime. Mm -hmm. It is what we do to God. As I said earlier, think of God. Does God forgive? Yes. He forgave a crime that threatened the universe. And he wants you to forgive a crime that just threatens your house. That's all. You have to forgive Russia. If you feel, if you got, you got to forgive Russia. Yes. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's hard, but it has to be done. But the Bible says, I can do all things, come on, through Christ. Mm-hmm. You see, God calls us to behave like him. Am I saying that clearly? The gospel brings us to the place where we behave like God. Mm -hmm, like God. 
forgive Russia, forgive whomever. The people in the South that had slavery, forgive. Forgive. That's why Christ died. Forgive. That's acting like God. Yes, sister. Go ahead. Mm hmm Mm -hmm. The cross is a revelation to our doubts and fears mm -hmm. of the pain that comes from the death. And he forgives. Nobody suffers like God. Nobody. And he forgives. So we must, our standards must be God's standards applied to us, not our standards. Let me. Father in heaven, as I continue, be with me, please, in Jesus' name, amen. You ever heard of Zeus? Who's Zeus? A Greek god. Ever heard of Aphrodite? Uh, a Greek goddess. You, you heard of these gods, the Roman gods and Greek gods. They were made by people. Are you following me? And so they committed adultery. They committed murder. They backstabbed each other. Those gods, they got drunk. Those gods, they had orgies. They did all of that. Of course, you know they didn't exist. It's just the mythology. But they did that because they were made by people. And that's how people behave. Are you with me? Now, some of us, we create God, our God, then we put him in the Bible. And we say, my God doesn't mind if a man marries a man. Well, yeah, that's your God. Are you following me? My God doesn't mind if I use the tithe to buy a ticket. My God doesn't mind if I, you know, have two girls at the same time, both pregnant for me. My God doesn't mind. That's your God you put in the Bible. But the God of the Bible, he minds. So we have to be careful what God we're following. The Roman gods and the Greek gods engage in all the sins human beings engage in because human beings made them. But because God made us, we must behave like God. Are you following me? We behave like God. You see, when you make something, you put yourself into the thing. If you're a musician, you can say, wait a minute, that's Mozart. Because he has a style. If you're an artist, that's uh, Monet or Manet or that's, uh, that's whomever. Because each artist has a style. When God made us, some of him was put into us. We were to be like him. When we make our gods, we put ourselves into them. And they behave like us. We're to be, yes. Okay, my, yeah, our Bible says that uh, we should, we should get, we should go get things with us, Jeremiah. Mm hmm. Book of Jeremiah. And, uh, you know, all through there, it says, you know, and, uh, and how they were punished, and, you know, the, uh, everything was destroyed because they were sinning. Mm hmm. And, uh, and, you know, but, and God said, everybody, what you all do, mm -hmm. you're going to have to suffer the consequences. Mm hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. God forgives, but you still suffer consequences. Forgiveness doesn't remove con let me let me say. Did Jesus save the thief on the cross? Yes or no? Did he leave him on the cross? Yes. Because he had committed crimes against society. The fact that God forgives you doesn't remove the you've been smoking 40 years and you come to Christ. Are you following me? You lose a lung. But are you saved? Yes. God's forgiveness does not remove consequences. But yes, they, no, no, they suffer the consequences. Not punishment, they suffer consequences. In other words, if a woman smokes dope, or you've heard of crack cocaine babies, it was a big thing a few decades ago, the baby is born high. The baby suffers the consequences, but the baby is not born guilty of that sin. Yes, we suffer the consequences. When Adam sinned, all his descendants came into the world needing a savior. Those are consequences. Yes, sin has consequences. Let, let, go to, go to, um, go to uh, Deuteronomy 8. It has consequences in both directions. Righteousness has consequences. Go to Deuteronomy 8. I get worked up sometimes, but don't let that, uh, don't call the police. Okay. Deuteronomy 8. Read verse 1. All the Thy command thee this day, uh huh. To do, uh huh. Uh huh. Uh huh. Uh huh. Uh -huh. What is God saying? What is God asking them to do? Obey. Now, go to the second commandment. 
Exodus 20, reading from verse 4. And we have to read that commandment microscopically. Exodus 20, reading from verse 4. You should be able to say it without looking. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them. Carefully now, for I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God. Now carefully, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. Generations to come suffer consequences. Now, Finish that verse. And shewing mercy unto thousands of... Now, the word thousands there means generations. Thousands of generations that love me and keep my commandments. Let me tell you something. When you obey God, your children are blessed. People wonder, why are the Jews so prosperous? Abraham was given a blessing. Are you, are you following me? And even though they're no longer God's favorite people, that blessing still stays. And so why did you so prosperous? Because that blessing, even though they rejected Christ. But the blessing stays on them as individuals. And even though God rejected them as a nation, he accepts them as individuals. So blessings can follow, curses can follow. But if I am a smoker, there are some people who inherit a, 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 a predisposition for alcoholism. Mm -hmm. The great-grandfather was a drunkard, the great-grandfather the was, the father was, and you were born with this, pre this one drink and you're gone. You suffer the consequences, not punishment. Are you with me? Not, so the Israelites sinned, God forgave them, but he had to teach them a lesson. We have to be, stay there in Babylon. But when the Babylonians got too rough, what did God do? He sent the Medo Persians to get rid of them. I punish my people, not you. Punishment is essential for spiritual growth. They have to learn. Be right with God. Mm -hmm. All Christians, you know, let me sin, and then I'm sorry, everything is hunky-dory. Mm -mm. You have to understand sin has no benefits. I may be forgiven, but I suffer. So avoid sin. You know, forgiveness is not a pill. You take it, and the disease is gone. Then you go do something immoral again. You take a pill, it's gone. You go do it, mm -mm 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 -mm. you got to pay. I'll save you, but you're going to suffer. You've got to understand, and the world must understand, sin has no benefits. So the Israelites suffered, but it wasn't God's fault. It isn't God's fault. If they had obeyed, the opposite would have happened. Mm -hmm. You can't just escape consequence. It's a law. In the day thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. You confess your sins, I'll forgive you. Action, consequence. But a consequence is not a punishment. But you suffer. The punishment is death. The best thing is avoid sin. Avoid sin. You think God loves to punish? It's a strange work. God loves to bless, not punish. He loves to bless, but we will not allow him to bless. We always put God in the position where he has to punish. And then we say God is a hard fellow. Mm -mm. He loves to bless. Obey. All right. I need some Kool-Aid. Anything else? Well, we'll pray eventually. We have to. Yes, sister. Uh huh. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Adam and Eve were sisters and brothers. Adam and Eve. No. <laughs> we have to think intelligently. Adam and Eve were the only two people on the face of the earth. They were not brothers and sisters. They were made by God. Now, Cain married a sister. That was fine back then because the world had to be populated. And the strength of the human body was such, it, was not, uh, it could overcome these genetic connections which cause problems today as the race has deteriorated and people have gone further and farther apart. It is not wise for relatives to marry. The results are seen in the children. But Adam and Eve, when God put them together, so you can't accuse God of wrongdoing, he put them together. 
Genesis 2, verse 21 to 23. He put them together. And he put a man with a woman, by the way. Not a man and a man. Are you with me? Something else. More I should have said he put a male and a female. Not two females or two males. He put a man and a woman, not a boy and a girl. There are too many girls who want boyfriends and boys who want girlfriends. God put a man and a woman, not a boy and a girl. And God was one of each, not one man and six women, one of each. By the way, it was the same way for animals. Animals also practice monogamy. Mm -hmm. It was only after sin that polygamy came among people and among animals. Before sin, animals were one lion, one lioness. One tiger, one tigress. One bull, one cow. Are you following me? Mm. Each one had one. Sin corrupted every single thing. Let me... There are some fish that live at the bottom of the ocean. They never come to the surface. Now, how can you tell that fish there's something called dry land? How do you tell that fish there's something called dry land? It makes no sense. Because all the fish knows is what? He lives at the bottom of the ocean. Now, you and I are surrounded by a world of sin. That's all we see. It's on the news, on the job, in the church. It's all, all we see is sin. But it takes an effort to tell people there's something called righteousness and right doing. It makes no sense to tell a person that union is unbiblical. That partnership is wrong. Because it's all around you. It's all around you. But it does not change, thus saith the Lord. Now they're advertising medications with two men looking at each other's eyes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's something called prep up, step up. An advertisement was on TV and other young boys touching each other and all this rubbish. It's widespread. Came in slowly, television shows with this person and that person loving each other, a woman kissing a woman on this show and that show. So it is introduced gradually. Now that it's law for man to marry a man. It, comes, it doesn't come in all at once. It comes gradually. We have to watch these gradual things. Let me give you another example. <laughs> the church is changing for the worse. I'll give you several examples. We used to say, God bless you. What is it now? Be blessed. We got off in the Pentecostal church. Or stay blessed. Be ble they are, there is a generation of young people who cannot say, God bless you. It's be blessed. That's a change that came in gradually. Now, because of social media, <laughs> you listen, you watch any video on TV, uh, the social, it's you guys, you guys, you guys. You come to the pulpit. And it's not brothers and sisters anymore. It's not saints of the living God. It's not beloved. It's not church. It is you guys. Especially young people. That's a change that's coming over. We used to... <laughs> When Facebook came along, they told you, like, share, and something else. Now, the word share has replaced witnessing. People don't witness anymore. What do they do? They share Jesus. There was a time you walked into an ABC and you see books for witnessing. Now you see books for sharing. The word witnessing is gone. Are you following me? In 1983, there was a radio station in New York City. One segment was devoted to rap. Rap was just coming up, hip-hop. And so the hosts of that program, instead of sending greetings, they started sending shout-outs. That's where it started. Shout-outs. Greeting was to... You see, a lot of music is rebellion. A lot of fashion is rebellion against the standards of society. Now, from the pulpit, people... <laughs> they send shout-outs. It's just creeping in. Just creeping in. Without much attention being paid at all. And so the, from the pulpit, the church sounds secular. Because it has adopted slowly the speech styles of the world. So a shout out, not greeting. How are you guys doing? Not brothers and sisters, not saints of living God. How are you guys? <laughs> Go share Jesus, forget witnessing. You know, it's a, not God bless you, be blessed. <laughs> it's all kinds of things. <laughs> 
We're sounding more and more like the world. My question is, what does the world pick up from us? We pick up everything from the world. What does the world pick up from us? Nothing. Anyway, all right. Well, we should pause because we can go all night saying this, 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 this. But let's focus on Jesus, not the problem. You know, Jesus said in uh, Isaiah 45, 22, look unto me and be saved. By the way, apply that approach anytime you have a problem. Don't ignore the problem, but focus on Christ. When the Israelites were bitten by snakes in Numbers 21, remember that story? What did God tell Moses? Build a brazen serpent, put it where? On a pole. What were they supposed to do? Ah, not at the snake bite. At that brazen, you see, Christ took our sins. You see, that's what it's telling us. Look at that serpent. By faith, you're looking at Christ. You'll be healed. Now, they could have looked at the bite. Nothing would have happened. You have a problem? Yes, you have a problem. We know that. Look to the source of a solution. That's Jesus. So Jesus says, look unto me. It doesn't mean ignore the problem completely, but don't focus on the problem. Focus on the source of power. You have a weakness, spiritual weakness, lying, stealing, whatever. Look at Christ who never lied and never stole. And let that focus give you the strength to be like Christ. Focus, look unto me. Consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself. Consider the apostle and high priest. Look at Jesus. Look at him. And you'll see God who has the power to help, you'll see a man who understands what you're going through. you see the creator, you see the sustainer, you see the son of God and your brother. you see the one who conquered death, hell, sin, the grave, and Satan. Look at Jesus, who is the head of the church. Look at him and the one who's coming back for you, if you're faithful. Even if you're not faithful, he's coming back but for different reasons. Are you following me? Uh, I don't want to miss heaven. I really don't. I want, the Bible says, when the Son of Man shall come in his glory and all the holy angels with him. I want to see that. Hmm? In my town of Ann Arbor, Michigan, we have the largest outdoor stadium in the United States. The football stadium seats about 118,000 people. On a Saturday when they're playing at home, don't try to drive through Ann Arbor. Forget it. Stay home. 118,000 people come to see 22 men hit each other, fall down, get up, fall down, get up, fall down, get up. Are you following me? They fall down, they get up. They fall down, they get up. And you pay $100 to see that. I want to see Jesus with all the holy angels. Huh? Now, one angel is a powerful being. When one angel came down at the tomb of Christ, there was an earthquake. All the Roman soldiers fainted. One. All of them are coming. All of them. All. Heaven will be empty. I want to see that. And then Christ will shout. All the righteous dead get up. That must be a noise. You need different ears to survive that noise, that sound. But we shall come up incorruptible. Are you following me? Different people physically. I want to see that. And of course, we go to heaven for a thousand years. Mm -hmm. In that time, we're judging fallen angels and human beings. After that, we come back with Christ. He wakes up all the wicked dead. And then he shows them the lives they have led. So that they realize we deserve what we're about to get. They all come together under Satan to attack the city. They realize it's a waste of time, then they turn on Satan. They see what they could have had. You know, nothing burns like regret, because regret tells you there's nothing you can do. And it burns like acid. And so I've always said, this is not a doctrine, this is my belief, the loss will burn twice. Once, when they have to see, I could have had this, and I'm not having it. That burns then they literally burn with fire. Literally. 
The first time God destroyed the world, he used water. The water destroyed but did not cleanse. Are you following me? The fire will destroy and cleanse. And then God will make a brand new world, as I said last night or this morning, and we will see him do it. I want to be there. I want to live in a world where you walk and you see Moses <laughs> walking down the street. How are you doing, Moses? <laughs> Fine. And then you turn around and here's Jesus sitting under a tree with uh, your cousin, <laughs> just talking. And then you walk by, an angel flies by. You say, how are you doing, Randy? I said, Fine. <laughs> this is no joke. And then there's God. We shall see his, there's God. You're still in awe, even though now you're sinless. This is God. And you go to a tree that has 12 fruits at the same time. <laughs> Are you following me? You go to one tree, pick a banana and an apple and a pineapple. <laughs> the same tree. Or a different one every month. We're not sure how it will work. No sickness. No death. No police. No crime. No COVID-19. I mean, no racial strife. Nothing. But busy people, because you have a universe to run under Jesus' direction. And then you decide to visit another planet, and you take off of that planet. And see how people lived in other worlds where sin never occurred. You know, Ella White was taken in vision to one of those worlds, and she saw the people. And she said they were beautiful and noble and stately. And she said to them, how are you so beautiful and noble? And they gave her two words, strict obedience. Then she told the angel, let me stay. The angel said, no, you have work to do. And she got depressed. Then she had to come back to this. <laughs> Ellen White tells us before Adam sinned, he could talk to a tree, a leaf, and the leaf would tell him how the leaf functions. Are you listening to me? <laughs> she said he could communicate with the smallest being or with a whale, the largest, and they would tell him how they function. We have lost so much because of sin. I want to get back. You know, I, <laughs> there are women today who talk to their plants. Are you following me? I've heard it has an effect. I don't know. I don't, I don't keep plants. My wife does. But you will be able to talk to a plant. It makes no sense now. It will make sense then. An elephant walks by, you talk to him. And no psychiatrist comes and gets you. Are you following me? You know, you talk to an elephant. <laughs> huh? A lion comes by, you pet him and you sit with him. This, this is the world that's coming. But you tell people that, they laugh at you. I want to be in that world. It'll be a world without sin. And God has to get us there first. As I always say, then he'll put us in a sinless. How many of you would like to live in a sinless world? Can I see your hand? Mm -hmm. Face to face with Christ. Let's get ready now. We're going to pray. Now, let me remind you of 2 Timothy 3. This know also that in the last time, last days, perilous time shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own self, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful and holy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent fears, despisers of those of the good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure, more than lovers of God, having a power, a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. Sorry for rattling it off. If anyone applies to you, we're confessing that. Are you following me? If there's somebody you need to forgive, you do that. Do you need to apologize? Make up your mind to go do it. And see the freedom you feel. I was preaching in London about forgiveness during a week of prayer. A lady got up and walked out. I didn't notice when she walked out. A few weeks later, she wrote me an email. She said, when you were talking about forgiveness, I walked out. I couldn't take it. But the Holy Ghost chased me out of the church. Not chased her out, but chased after her when she left. And gave her no rest because she had an issue with a sister of hers, a, a, a stepsister, over 20, 25 years. And she had not forgiven her stepsister for treating her badly when the father remarried. You know how that goes. Then she made an attempt and she finally located the stepsister to apologize for saying, I treated you badly, forgive me. No, the stepsister had treated her badly and she wanted to say, I forgive you for what you've done to me. The stepsister had been trying to reach her over the years. 
because the stepsister had become an Adventist like she was. And she said, we cried and cried and cried on the phone. And the subject heading of her team email to me was, I am free. I was in Ghana talking to young people at a university. I was doing one-to-one -one counseling. This young lady came to me. She hated her father. Her father had remarried. And she thought the father was treating the stepdaughters, the, her daughter more than, the stepdaughter more than he was treating her own biological daughter. And she hated that, so she would fail her classes to hurt her father. It's amazing how people hurt themselves to hate other people. Cut off your nose to hurt some, anyway. I said to her, you must forgive your father. She said, no. I said, my sister, you must forgive your father. She said, no. So let's pray. <clears throat> so we knelt down. I said, uh, you pray first. She started. Then she stopped. I said, safe, Father, I forgive my father. She said, no. I said, my sister, tell God you forgive your father. I said, say after me. Father in heaven, Father in heaven, I forgive my father. I said, say after me, Father in heaven. And finally she said, I, she started to cry. She said, I forgive my father. She cried so hard. And we prayed and she left. Three weeks later, she, I sent her, she sent me an email. She said, Elder Skeet, I am a different person. I am a different person. Free. I no longer carry that. I was somewhere preaching. The Lord takes me everywhere. So I, uh, this lady came, do you remember me? And I said, no. <laughs> she said, you spoke about forgiveness. And I decided to forgive. She said, I'm a free person. Forgiveness frees you. It also opens the way to free the other person because sometimes the other person is stuck by pride. You know you've done wrong, but you can't find it to say, I'm sorry, you're so proud. When you, the innocent person, comes, you see, it breaks the person down. The person knows, you know, I'm the guilty one. Why is she coming to me? And it allows the person to say, no, it was my fault. So you free yourself and you open the prison. A guilty person is in prison. And by your humility, you see, God didn't sin, Adam sinned, but God came to him. That's the godly way. We fold our arms and say, no, let him come to me, and don't let him walk, let him crawl. That's the way we are. No, 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 God says, no, 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 no. If you're innocent, you go. Let the innocent one move first. And it frees both people. So if you have to forgive someone, do that. Grudges can cause cancer. Grudges can cause high blood pressure. Grudges can constrict your arteries. I'm serious. You can have, these non-physical things can have physical results. Cause ulcers because you have a grudge. We'll forgive. We'll go apologize to those we've hurt and see if you don't have a testimony to give. And if anything in 2 Timothy 3, 1 to 5 applies to you, we confess it to God today. Because we do not want to contribute to perilous times. All right. Let's sing into my heart. Then we'll kneel. I'll give you a minute or two to pray quietly. Then I'll pray out loud. Into my heart. Into my heart. Come into my heart. Lord Jesus. Come in today, come in to stay, come into my heart, Lord Jesus. Let's kneel.